Good evening. Welcome to the York County School Board regular meeting for February 1st. Thank you for coming out. We're going to start this evening with the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'd like to say a few words about our pledge leader. This evening is Neandra Kata. Neandra, come on up. Neandra is a fifth grade student at Bethel Manor Elementary School. Neandra is a strong student who establishes goals and puts forth her best effort each and every day. Neandra's favorite subjects are math, science, and writing. In school and at home, Neandra is an author who enjoys writing stories. She excels in creating original stories and working with her classmates on collaborative writing projects. She has a clever eye for million dollar words and crafty descriptions. Her voice is present in all that she writes. Neander also enjoys helping in the classroom, working with others, and problem solving. Neander is a great school citizen who comes to school prepared to learn and help others every day. Please stand with us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Andra. This time we're going to move into our awards and recognitions part of our program. And first up on the agenda are the seniors of the month. And Ms. Haywood, I believe you have the first senior. I do. I'm delighted to introduce to you the senior of the month for January from Bruton High School, Jessica Cherie Robinson. If you will stand, and parents, whoever else is with you, mom, dad, everybody, everybody, <coughs> and let me share some information with you about Jessica. Bruton High School is proud to honor Jessica Robinson as senior of the month for January. Jessica is a compassionate, determined, and trustworthy student who is very dedicated to her school. She is very involved with SOA, dance arts, and recently danced during the pregame show and halftime of the Russell Athletic Bowl in Orlando, Florida. Jessica has maintained a 4.23 GPA while participating in field hockey, SOA dance arts, and various school clubs such as the Health Occupation Students of America, Chemistry Honor Society, and the National Honor Society. Jessica has received the Academic High Honors Award since her freshman year. She has also received the Afro-Academic Afro Cultural, Technical, and Science Olympics AXO Award for three years. This award, rec is recon this award recognition is sponsored by the NAACP. Jessica is also an active leader in her church. She helps with Vacation Bible School and volunteers at the homeless shelter in the community. Please join me in congratulating Jessica. And Mrs. Kirschke. Yes, I would like to ask Michaela Swan to stand along with parents Darren and Alexis Swan. And if you have any other family members, please join. It is with great pleasure that Grafton High School has chosen Ms. Michaela Swan as its Senior of the Month for January 2016. Michaela, or Munch, as she is so affectionately <laughs> called, is a member of the National Honor Society, Spanish Honor Society, DECA, FBLA, and the African American History Club. Michaela has also earned highest honors at Grafton for all four years. Never one to waste time, Michaela has been an active member of her community where her volunteer work extends beyond the school walls. There she has given of her time and talents to Habitat for Humanity, where she helps to build and restore homes for the less fortunate, Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and the Mariner's Museum. In addition, she still finds time to work in the family business, Love in a Cup. Michaela is likewise an avid all-around athlete. She played JV and varsity soccer and basketball for four years and is currently a captain on the girls' basketball team. 
Grafton High School is honored to recognize Michaela Swan as its January Senior of the Month. And as busy as she is, Michaela manages to maintain a 4.29 GPA and hopes to attend either Howard University or North Carolina A&T next fall. Congratulations, Michaela. We are very proud of you. Mr. Mentor. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bull. <clears throat> it's a real privilege and honor to introduce to you Grafton High School's uh, senior in the month of December who could not be with us at the last meeting, and that would be D.J. Dobbins. If you're here, please stand, and your parents, Barry and Patty Dobbins, and all family, please stand. Okay. Let me read a little bit about uh, D.J. Grafton High School has the honor of recognizing D.J. Dobbins as a senior month for December. D.J. is a member of the National Honor Society, having earned the highest honors every year since ninth grade at Grafton. He served as vice president of the junior class last year and is currently vice president of the senior class. DJ has played varsity football and baseball for four years at Grafton and has been team captain the last two years for both sports. He earned second team all conference in baseball and honorable mention in football as quarterback and defensive, defensive back. In 2014, DJ was a member of the conference championship baseball team that finished second in the state. DJ has carried his diligence and work ethics into serving the community as well. He volunteers for the National Honor Society, coaches an upward basketball team, gives freely of his time to help his, with the community landscaping, and works at a local soup kitchen for the homeless during the holidays. DJ has been a tremendous asset to Grafton High School and plans to attend East Carolina University or the University of Virginia next fall. Please join me in congratulating DJ Dobbins, Grafton's December Senior of the Month. I have the privilege this evening of introducing the Senior of the Month from Tab High School, Miles Ross. And Miles. Your mom and dad, Isaac, and Dr. Phyllis Ross. Nice to have you with us this evening. Miles Ross is an outstanding student and young man. He has achieved at the very highest levels in the classroom while being an exemplary citizen. Miles attends the New Horizon Governor School for Science and Technology and maintains a cumulative GPA of 4.4166. He will be recognized this month by AXO as the top achieving African-American student at Tab High School. Outside of the classroom, Miles is a member of the National Honor Society and Mu Alpha Theta. He is a member of the varsity basketball team and has previously participated in Tab's track program and band. Miles is also active in his church. Miles generously serves others through his participation with Jack and Jill of America for whom he acts as chaplain. He is an active volunteer in the organization. Polite to a fault and always thoughtful of others first, Miles is a role model at Tab High School. He holds himself to the highest standards while generously accepting the shortcomings of others. He is an excellent citizen. and We are proud to present Miles Ross as Tab High School's January Senior of the Month. Congratulations. <laughs> And Mr. Medford. Thank you, Dr. George. Destiny Martinez, uh, January's Senior of the Month for York High School. Are you here? <clears throat> no, she is not here. Well, we're going to read this anyway, and then we'll try to get, bring her back to another meeting. York High School is pleased to announce the selection of Destiny Martinez as the January Senior of the Month. Destiny is passionate about her academics, as is evident in her maintaining academic honors and her 3.50 GPA. While balancing a variety of activities would pose a challenge to most students, Destiny manages the rigorous demands of academics while participating in basketball, softball, and art. Her freshman year, she has been on the academic honor roll, and in her sophomore year, she verbally committed to Longwood University on a softball scholarship. This year, she officially signed to attend Longwood University to play softball. Destiny plays travel 
softball for the Richmond Ruckus organization. She volunteers her time teaching young Little League players proper skills and softball techniques and has been in charge of workstations for college softball recruiting camps. Destiny is currently employed at Holiday Retirement and is also, and also at Plaza Azteca in New Yorktown. She's very focused and businesslike in her demeanor and relationship with others. Destiny is selfishless, perceptive, highly motivated, and truly talented. She is an absolute leader. She is a role model and a positive influence in the York High School community. She has the ability to balance many activities at once while excelling at all of them. York High is proud of Destiny and her accomplishments. Let's give a round of applause in her absence. Congratulations, Destiny. At this time, Ms. Haywood, I'm going <clears> to <throat> turn the meeting over to you while we go down Thank for you. our Student Service Awards. Thank you. And as Dr. George and Dr. Shandor are moving down, uh, we remind you that this board will take a recess, but we're going to move that recess until after the Read Across America presentation so that we can come down and meet with everybody. So if you will just stay put until after we do all of our awards and recognitions. We have two uh, Student Service Award winners. The first is from Bethel Manor Elementary, and Mr. Medford, you will introduce this student. I do have that student, and that's Thomas Gallman. If you can come up with your principal, Mr. Lombardo. Bethel Manor Elementary School is proud to recommend our outstanding fifth grade student, Thomas Gallman, for the Student Service Award. Thomas is an excellent school citizen who has made a profound impact within his school and community. Thomas entered fourth grade and begun fifth, began fifth grade as part of the Eagle News Network Board. His daily role as morning anchor assists in establishing a positive expectation for Bethel Manor students. In passing, younger students often view Thomas as a celebrity when spotted in the hallway. <laughs> in, the, in the fall of 2015, Thomas launched a school-wide campaign to become a candidate for student council president of Bethel Manor Elementary School. After much suspense, Thomas vowed of teamwork and tackling school challenges was successful, and he was elected as the new leader. Through his position, Thomas was able to initiate a food drive for the local SPCA in preparation for the frosty season ahead. As a fellow classmate stated, Tommy is one of the, is, Thomas is the best one for president. Who could be more responsible? In fact, many of Thomas's classmates feel the same way, and due to his accountability and mature conduct, he was unanimously selected as the class representative for October's character trait, responsibility. Thomas also displays outstanding academic performance by maintaining honor roll status each quarter Thomas is a caring and generous person who, as a, who is an exemplary model of what we expect of a school citizen and is worthy of notice and appreciation. Thomas, great job. Congratulations. We're proud of you. And next, Mr. Mentor has York River Academy. Thank you, Mrs. Haywood. It's a real privilege and honor for me to introduce to you York River Academy's Student Service Award winner for January 2016, be Joshua Wright. If you come forward, Joshua, with your principal, Mr. Walt Cross. Read a little bit about uh, Joshua. Uh, Joshua Wright is a senior at York River Academy and is a unanimous choice of this year's Student Service Award. Josh has been a student at York River Academy for his entire high school career and has developed into one of the most talented and service-oriented students in the school. Josh has a unique and very important part to play in the life of York River Academy. And in the following comments from teachers, you'll be able to catch a glimpse of what Josh means to all of us at York River Academy and his exemplary accomplishment. Josh was the first student at York River Academy to pass the Adobe Photoshop certification test and after taking the lead there, took it on himself to search out web-based tutorials for the Adobe site and to pass along 
that information to students and staff. He was the winner of two logo and poster contests designing the posters used for the Walk a Mile in Her Shoes event as well as the winning poster for the York Women's Business Association. Josh is always ready and willing to accept additional school projects. He is an artistic eye for graphic design and has talent in photography and video editing. Josh was the producer, cameraman, and editor of the Hometown Heroes uh, project that was presented to the school board as an accent on academics. According to another teacher, Josh's patient and expertise guided the creation of the tour video used for recruiting students for York River Academy. It is, prof it is professional and it is, its presentation and scope was very consistent in the way that it captures each of the classrooms and with an upbeat techie music background. The eighth graders loved it. Josh is a leader in our school as well as being involved in projects that will have him teaching other York River Academy students how to capture images and edit them into finished products. He has spent a lot of extra time in learning many of the advanced features of Photoshop, Final Cut Pro, and other programs and applications. Josh worked several jobs outside of school to purchase his own camera and other professional type accessories. Josh is a great communicator and has a wonderful attitude and desire to serve. Josh is a member of the Colonial Williamsburg Fife and Drum Corps and is actively involved in the youth group at his church. Josh has made a lasting impression on York River Academy with his service and attitude and has certainly set the bar very high with his talent and skills. Josh hopes to continue his service and a high level of professional expertise in the United States Air Force after serving a second semester internship with the York County School Division Community and Public Relations Department. Josh, we're proud of you. Please join me in congratulating Josh. Thank you, and we now move to the Community Volunteers uh, of the Month. And we have one volunteer, and that's coming from Bethel Manor, and that's Mrs. Kersky. Yes, it is my pleasure to announce the Volunteer of the Month for January, Mrs. Christy Silva, and she's coming forward with Principal Mike Lombardo. Mrs. Christy Silva has been an active parent volunteer at Bethel Manor Elementary School for several years. She currently serves as secretary of the PTA Executive Board. Mrs. Silva's work as a volunteer has made, her, has made a profound impact on the Bethel Manor Elementary School community. Through her extensive work as a PTA Executive Board member over the past two years, the PTA has continued to enhance the student's school experience and support staff members with instructional endeavors. Beyond her exemplary efforts as the PTA's secretary, Christy's commitment to volunteering is inspiring. She currently serves as the chairperson of reflections, school dance, and talent show committees. Due to Christy's efforts with the reflections program, Bethel Manor saw an increase in student participation, and the program was a huge success this year. Christy's leadership, attention due to detail, and tireless efforts ensured that this year's sock hop dance was also a tremendous success. Christy worked tirelessly to plan the event, coordinate volunteer assistance, and decorate the school's cafeteria. In addition to her leadership and coordination of events, Christy is always willing to help the school community. Whether serving on the PTA executive board, coordinating school-wide events, or volunteering in the classroom, Christy is always willing to help students, families, and staff at Bethel Manor Elementary School. Bethel Manor is fortunate to have such a dedicated parent, and we truly appreciate her school-wide volunteer efforts. Please join me in congratulating Mrs. Christy Silva as Bethel Manor's Volunteer of the Month. We will now 
have a presentation from the York Foundation for Public Education, and Mrs. Kersky will do the introductions. Yes, I would like to invite Dr. Kermit Ashby and Mrs. Denise Ashby of the York Foundation for Public Education to the stage, along with Neandra Kata, Thomas Gallman, Joshua Wright, and our Seniors of the Month. The York Foundation for Public Education would like to congratulate Neandra Kata, a fifth grader from Bethel Manor Elementary School, for reciting the Pledge of Allegiance at tonight's school board meeting. She did a wonderful job. We would also like to recognize tonight's Student Service Award recipients, Thomas Gallman from Bethel Manor Elementary School and Joshua Wright from York River Academy. We're going to try to take a picture and the stage may get a little bit full, but we're going to just stretch you out. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thomas Gallman and Joshua Wright are Student Service Award recipients. <laughs> and we also want to congratulate our seniors of the month, Jessica Robinson from Bruton High School, Michaela Swan from Grafton High School, Miles Ross from Tab High School, and David DJ Dobbins, Grafton's December senior of the month. And we'll be sure to get Destiny's cookie to her soon. The Special gifts from Cookie Text and Edible Tweet are being presented on behalf of the York Foundation for Public Education in partnership with their donor, Jeannie Fioka, of Cookie Text and Edible Tweet. Congratulations to all of you students. We are so very proud of you. Thank you all. Enjoy those cookie tweets. <laughs> okay, at this time we have a presentation or accent on academics, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sander. Thank you, Dr. George and board members. For this evening's ac accent on academics, Yorktown Middle School will present All is Relative Toot uh, Our. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> it's in French, and I had three years of Spanish. <laughs> Toot Our Relatif. Hopefully that's correct which means everything is relative. Yorktown Middle School eighth grade French two students use prior knowledge of their local community history to create a museum exhibit demonstrating the extent of the involvement of the French in the Revolutionary War and the bias in the retelling of history as it relates to the Battle of Yorktown. Dr. Susan Hutton, principal, will now introduce tonight's presenters. Dr. Hutton. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. Also, good evening, Chairman of the Board, Dr. George, and esteemed school board members. I am Susan Hutton, Principal of Yorktown Middle School, and tonight I'm excited to share one of our World Language Teachers projects from last year. Madam Kaufman Perry's French two students worked in teams to talk about historical perspective and bias in English and French. The students used critical thinking, made real life connections, and collaborated with their peers and community at large using both English and French history and languages. The project was a co collaboration with sixth and seventh grade social studies and English teachers, the French American School of Norfolk, the NATO French community, the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, and the Yorktown Victory Center Museum. In teams of four or five students, they wrote reports in both languages, created codes and links to the Yorktown Virginia Center Museum. Mrs. Price Hardister from the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation visited the classroom during the learning process and provided feedback on the students' projects. The class showcased their final work on May 9th at the museum. The class also went on a field trip to see the frigate Hermione at Yorktown in June. With me this evening is Madame Kaufman Perry, 
French teacher at Yorktown Middle School, and three of her current and former students, Kevin Rinke, Sophie Martin, and David Patterson, who at this time will tell us more about the project Tout All Relatif, or Everything is Relative. Thank you, Dr. Hutton. Good evening. Dr. Shandor, Dr. George, and members of the school board, I am Minouche kaufman Perry. I led, designed, and implemented the project-based unit called Tout est Relatif, Everything is Relative, with the collaboration and support of parents, administrators, social studies, French, and technology teachers, as well as the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation Education Coordinator, Mrs. Price Hardister. In designing the project, our goal was not only to incorporate the American Council of the Teaching of Foreign Languages skills for French too, and the use of the past and present tenses. It was also to make cross-cultural, I apologize, this was not started. Cross-cultural connections, um, collaboration, I'm sorry, cross, uh, collaborations, uh, include writing across the curriculum in both the target language and in English. Uh, the 21st century competencies included collaboration and communication skills that are used extensively in the students' interviews electronically and communication skills that were used to interview the primary sources. To gather the bank of knowledge used to, for the creation of the museum exhibits and presentations. The use of technology was instrumental in gathering, sorting, discriminating, organizing, and creating QR codes to present the information for an accurate retelling of the historical factors leading to the victory at Yorktown in 1781. In addition, students learned about the important role of the city of Yorktown, where they all reside, and how it played a role during the Revolutionary War. <clears throat> students compared and contrasted how this victory is taught to native French students in France and where they learn here. Finally, in keeping with the goals of our school's improvement plan, we incorporated writing skills into the various phases of the project. This was evident in the culminating presentation that required persuasive speech writing and public speaking skills, informational writing such as showing the role of bias when writing history, summarizing and paraphrasing of information from their research in both French and English. And I will finish by saying a quote from Mrs. Price Hardister. Every student used excellent public speaking skills, poise and comfort levels in speaking French and loud enough that could be heard clearly in the back of a room with about 65 to 70 people, including the French perspective. From ex for example, what do the French think of Benjamin Franklin today? Mm -hmm. And now we'll present to you David, Sophie, and Kivy. When I first heard about the Tutsi Relative Project, I figured it was going to be another average history project that I've done every year since the first grade. <laughs> However, my opinion was changed in, uh, when we started working on the project in early December of 2014. When our group started working on the project, our French teacher, Madame Perry, informed us that we needed to bo incorporate both the French and English languages. Sophie and I, along with Kylie Dryden and Sarah Moneymaker, uh, met at the Yorktown Library several, several times brainstorming ideas and discussing our roles towards the research and presentation. Because of the day and age that we live in, Sophie Martin and I decided to incorporate easy to use technology to attract a younger audience as well as create an interactive exhibit. Hence we created our own quick response barcodes or QR codes for short and translated them into both French and English. A QR code is a small matrix barcode containing information that can be easily accessed by downloading a free QR scanner app to any smartphone or tablet. This not only saved on space, but allowed visitors to Yorktown the option to scan and read the desired information in either French or English. This was to prepare for the visit of the French frigate Ermignon and her French-speaking crew and visitors. <clears throat> We also wrote letters to the French students at the French American School of Norfolk asking them what they knew of the Revolutionary War and the impact the French had. We found out that the French students did not know about October 19th until they visited Yorktown. Not only did we get their opinion, we also wrote letters and interviewed French, French Commandant Major Prou, Chief of the NATO French National Support Element at Norfolk. He shared his knowledge to help us make authentic exhibits. One of the things he told the Rochambeau group was that there was a Francophobia at the time. 
You do not always get the French point of view when you're in history class, so it was refreshing to look at history from a different angle. It was amazing seeing our projects in the museum, as well as going to see the Hermione and getting interviewed by various newspapers from all over Hampton Roads and from France. It was really gratifying knowing that our projects weren't for naught and that people actually cared about what we had created. It is preferable d'être seul plutôt que d'être en mauvaise compagnie. It is far better to be alone than to be in bad company. I came from overseas and I didn't know a whole lot of English. My French was wicked best. I didn't know about the history of Yorktown at all. The Tutus Relative project not only taught me about local and national history, but it also taught me or helped me with my speech in French and English. <coughs> everyone knows who George Washington General was, but not everyone knows who his best friend was, General Lafayette, whom he met during the Revolutionary War. This project not only impacted my life, but it also impacted the life of the people in this community. It feels like many people have become numb to the British history right here in Yorktown. I felt like my French classes project and the visit of the Hermione was an importance to the awakening, awakening of the role of the French in winning the Revolutionary War right here in Yorktown. I think that October 19th should be a county holiday. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Any comments by the board members? Um, October 19th is a county holiday. Um, just not a school holiday, but, <laughs> but it was a school holiday way back when, so maybe we ought to revisit that. Um, but yeah, great presentation, um, especially for coming from York Middle School, what can I say? Um, but I like the fact that you, what you said at the very beginning and when, you present, when the students started presenting, and that was um, you just thought it was going to be just another project. And then all of you found out it was much, much more than that. So that's what we, we as school board members really like to hear because we know then you're going to walk away with something that you'll never forget and you'll be able to share with others. But it, it, it just, we live here. This is Yorktown. I mean, and, and to bring that to life. Um, Great, wonderful, did a great job. Thank you. I was going to say the same thing. I, I was really impressed when you when you first spoke and you said you thought it was going to be another history project that you'd had all these year, year after year. But uh, I, I, what was the ingredient that really uh, woke you up in this project? Um, it was mostly. It wasn't just for our benefit. It was for everybody who viewed the project that would learn more. So if, you know, uh, for instance, I didn't know some of the things that we put into this project and it helped me learn a lot. And, you know, w back in whenever we learned about the Revolutionary War, you, you never really learn as much as we did during this project because, you know, we just glance over it because we live in an area that the Revolutionary War really took place in. So to learn more from the French, French side, was a really big impact for, for me personally and I'm sure it it helped everybody else who viewed the project you know it hit really close to home so. well done you guys did a great job Very good. I was, I, I, <clears throat> just like to echo echo the, their comments I, I'm you know one of the things that always sort of troubles me is when <clears throat> folks that live here their whole life and they know nothing about Jamestown Yorktown Williamsburg, basically, and uh, sometimes that happens. You know, you get so uh, just so complacent and so used to everyday life. So when you when you bring this thing to the forefront, especially in the in the schools like this, I just think it's wonderful. I mean, our history here it's not ordinary history; it's extraordinary history. I mean, what happened here, right here in our backyard. So I am just so glad to see that uh, you know just at least one more person hears this and puts this in a, in a different perspective than just day-to-day -day living. So thank you so much. My question for them. Impressive presentation. And with, with your experience now, what would you like to do as the next step with what you've learned? Loaded question. <laughs> it, I guess it would be really interesting to see 
you know, other classes do this, other, you know, subjects necessarily kind of involve Yorktown in various projects that we do because like um, Mr. George, is that your name? Yeah, yeah like Mr. George said, people kind of um, become numb to the history here. So it would be interesting to see, you know, other schools, other classes sort of involve history, Yorktown, and so, yeah, so people here can really realize that we live in an important place and it's not necessarily just history. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. We're going to have a little change in our agenda this evening. We're going to move one of the items that we had under presentations up to the last uh, last one under awards and recognitions for the sake of time. And as you're getting ready to see, this is always one of my favorites every year. And Dr. Shander, would you have a few comments on that? Absolutely. So we're really pleased to bring forth um, Carol Bauer, who is one of our outstanding teachers in YCSD. She teaches at Grafton Bethel Elementary School. And as you can see, she's coming forward with a number of her friends to share information regarding Read Across America. So I'll let Ms. Bauer introduce her, de her guests. Carol, let me over here. I think so. Mine is the old. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> How is this? NEA <laughs> <laughs> and the YEA, your county schools encourages parents, big sisters and brothers, and volunteers to pick up a book and read with a child. Did you know? that a new book has been discovered from Dr. Seuss called What Pet Should I Get? What do you think? What pet should you get? The answer is pick one that fits you. Just like a good book, go ahead and just pick a book that fits you. Pets and books both come in different colors, sizes, and shapes. But I can tell you that children make terrible pets. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you agree that person's a person no matter how small? There's always room for a new friend and a new letter, just like in Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. <laughs> Will there be enough room? Meeting your friends and reading new books is important to me. Throughout my childhood, I have learned a vast amount that I wouldn't have been able to if books weren't diverse. Each book has its own meaning or its own unique feeling that it leaves on me. In addition, I have so many personal interests that wouldn't be all met if books were the same. Books wouldn't be of any essence without diversity. One book I've really enjoyed is Out of My Mind by Sharon Draper. I will now read a quote. I have no idea how I untangled the complicated process of words and thoughts but it happened quickly and naturally. By the time I was two, all my memories had words, and all my words had meanings, but only in my head. I have never spoken one single word. I am 11 years old. Diversity in books is important because it is what makes people read. If all books were the same, there would be no point in reading or learning at all. We read books to learn and entertain ourselves. When we read the same book over and over, it's difficult to learn anything new. The book Midnight for Charlie Bone by Jenny Nimmo reminds that we all can have different interests and that's okay. I think that diversity in books is important because it one teaches you that we are not the only culture on earth. Learning about diversity in books makes you sympathetic to other races, cultures, or religions. I think it is good to be diverse in many things. You're, Life, friends, family, food, perhaps we should be open to learning about new cultures. When I apply this to books, I think about Wonder, which is about August, a kid with a facial deformity that has been stared and looked at. He's been prevented from going to school until, he's been a fit, until he is a fifth grader. He hopes to make friends with normal kids despite his appearance. August wrote an essay, Your Deeds Are Your Monuments. 
This means that we should be remembered for the things we do. The things we do are the more important things of all. They are more important than what we say or what we look like. There's always enough room for new ideas and to learn how to make our deeds count every day. If we don't have diversity in books, then we ourselves might fail to be unique. I think also that if we aren't unique, then we aren't ourselves. And in order to be ourselves, we need to have diversity in books. Esperanza Rising is interesting because of all the Spanish influence. It's not your typical young adult fiction. Usually we might have an American hero or heroine, maybe in middle school, but mostly leading a normal life. But this book goes from both polar opposites. The main character, Esperanza, was rich and led an easy, spoiled life. It was great for her until her father dies and a ranch house catches on fire, forcing them to move from Mexico to the U.S. A quote from this book is, When you scorn these people, you scorn Miguel, Hortensia, and Alfonso, and you embarrass me and yourself. As difficult as it is to accept, our lives are different now. Esperanza has to accept change, the same way that we all do. We need the different views, all the different standpoints to become better people. We should never scorn others, and that's why I think we need diversity in books. One, two. You are never, you are never too, too late. late. To wacky and too wild to pick up a book and read with a child. Consider the messages of Dr. Seuss and others and pick up a book to read with a child. Take time to read books with different heroes and heroines, assorted situations, and diverse cultures. <laughs> Will there be enough room? We just want to take this moment to make sure we encourage everyone reads with children and York County is proud to be sponsors with the York Education Association for Read Across America. And thank you to all these fabulous students here who wrote those words about diverse books. So I think that's tremendous. So appreciate all of that. Thank you very much. Great job. At this time, we're going to take a short recess so that we can come down and meet all of our award recipients this evening. Oh. Welcome back to our regularly scheduled business meeting. At uh, this time, we move into our business portion of the meeting and we have any unfinished business. Is there any unfinished business that anybody would like to meet? Moving along, under presentations, we have two this evening. Uh, the first uh, pertaining to the Youth Commission. I'm going to ask Dr. Shander to go ahead and introduce that, please. Thank you, Dr. George. Board members, we're now going to hear from several students from the York County Youth Commission, a 15-member student-led group appointed annually by the Board of Supervisors. They're here tonight to share results with us from a recent student survey they conducted as well as some upcoming news of particular interest to high school students and their parents. At this time, I'd like to invite Connor Pittman, the Youth Commissioner's Chairman this year, to come to the podium. Good evening, Mr. Chair members of the school board, and Dr. Shandor. My name is Connor Pittman, and I am a junior at Hampton Roads Academy. I am joined tonight by four of my colleagues of the York County Youth Commission, or YCYC for short. The first three who will share are members of the YCYC Student Relations Committee, which is responsible for our student surveys. The fourth member is our secretary this year. Before they all report to you on behalf of the entire Youth Commission, I want to express our sincere appreciation for giving us this opportunity to share with you and our fellow citizens tonight. For anyone watching this meeting who may not know, the YCYC is a 15-member student-led group of high school students that was established by the Board of Supervisors in 1983. Student applicants are elected annually by the supervisors. Our primary mission is to help represent youth issues, concerns, <coughs> and suggestions to the supervisors so that our community can be an even better place to live. We could not achieve this goal without the assistance and close cooperation of the school division, and we're very grateful for that relationship. Our year, 
Our year began with orientation in August. We learned about York County government, the Youth Commission's bylaws, and committee structure. We also began discussing our goals for this school year. In September, we began our regularly mo scheduled monthly meetings and also met together for one Saturday for team building exercises. The morning ground-based exercises focused on teamwork, communication, patience, leadership, and risk-taking to achieve results. This really strengthened our ability to plan together and problem solve, and we began to gel more as a unit. The second half of our challenge course day was spent in high elements. On this, we each learned to stretch our own comfort zone and to encourage one another. The whole experience brought us much closer as a team. Good evening. I am Claire Dew and I am a senior at Tab High School. Our presentation tonight is in two parts. First, we will report on our first cafeteria mini survey of the year, which was given in all the high schools to interested students during their lunch blocks this past December. Following that, we will mention some upcoming opportunities for high school youth. The cafeteria mini surveys are short four question surveys that usually include both county and school related items. These half-sheet surveys are inexpensive, provide quick results, and do not interfere with instructional time. The Student Relations Committee began the survey design process by first studying previous surveys to see if there were any past questions that merited follow-up. We also reviewed the most frequently asked questions from students participating in last, year, last spring's high school town hall meetings with members of the Board of Supervisors and the school board. That proved to be most helpful for this survey. Our goal at each high school is to offer the opportunity to take the survey to as many students as possible. Some are either not interested or don't feel they have the time. Years ago, local survey experts advised the Youth Commission that since the survey was not randomly administered, for reliability's sake, the goal should always be to achieve a minimum participation rate of at least 15 to 18 percent of the students. As the slide shows, the 11 cafeteria mini-surveys conducted prior to this school year had an average participation rate of 31% of the high school population in the county's public high schools. We are very pleased with the sample size of the first survey this school year, which was administered in each high school during all three lunch blocks on December 4th. The survey was taken by almost 1,700 students across the county, or roughly 39% of the student population. It represents a creditable number of students, and we hope to improve on this for our second semester survey in the spring. Please note that no single question received this full participation rate, so the percentages shown for each question are based on the actual number of countable respondents for that question rounded to the nearest whole number. With only 15 members spread across the county, the Youth Commission is not large enough to effectively administer a survey in each high school during every lunch block. But we are fortunate to partner in this with the respective national honor societies at each school. We want to acknowledge and thank the respective principals, NHS students, and faculty sponsors shown here uh, for their tremendous assistance and support. The first two questions focus on county-related issues. The first question concerned volunteer opportunities in the county which was a concern posed by students at three of the high schools for last spring's town hall meetings. So this question asks, how do you feel about the number of volunteer and community service opportunities in York County? Students were asked to circle one of the response choices as shown. If you combine the percentage totals for A and B, 62% of students indicated their satisfaction that there was at least a fair amount of volunteer and community service opportunities here in the county. While that is good news, it's clear more can be done, and the YCYC has our sights set on that. 19% or almost one in five students surveyed felt the need for more opportunities to volunteer and or wanted more publicity about available opportunities. Developing that publicity for volunteer opportunities is one of the goals our public relations committee is working on. Hi, my name is Sarah Little, and I'm a sophomore at Bruton High School. The second question dealt with the issue of public transportation. Students at all three large high schools in the southeastern half of the county asked this question for the town hall meetings, and so the, 
And so this survey question was given to students at York, Grafton, and Tab High Schools and at York River Academy. It was not given to students at Bruton since many of them already have access to public transportation provided through the Williamsburg Area Transit Authority, which York County helps fund. A pilot program in the lower end of the county years ago showed there was not enough ridership to support public transportation. And so our question asked students, if available, would you regularly use reasonably priced public transportation buses to travel around the York, Grafton, and Tab areas of the county? 40% of the students surveyed indicated they would, while the majority of 60% indicated that they would not. For Bruton High School students, their second question concerned safety on Rochambeau Drive. It was also a result of town hall meetings. Two years ago, a few students had asked, the question, had asked that the speed limit be lowered in the school zone in front of the school after a VDOT traffic study led to the speed limit being raised to 45 miles per hour when the safety lights are flashing. Last spring, no one asked that question again, but the question was raised about adding a sidewalk or bike lane on Rochambeau to help make things safer for bikers coming to school on this two-lane road. So students were giving the following question. In the past, some students have expressed concerns about safety on Rochambeau Drive. Please circle the one choice below that best describes your feelings. As you can see, 45% indicated that they would be most like to see that they would most like to see a sidewalk or bike lane added, while only 3% wanted the speed limit lowered. 23% wanted both of those items, while 29 felt that no changes along Rochambeau were needed. Hi, my name is Ariel Spala and I'm a senior at Grafton High. Our last two questions focused on school issues. For the past several years, the topic of school day start times has been a big issue for a lot of high school students and parents. This is true here in the county as expressed by students in town hall meetings, but also across the state. So we decided to get updated student input on this topic. We asked students to pick their preference from the four different school start time options shown here. But we also wanted to make sure that students considered the approximate corresponding school day end times, with each option as also shown. And so we stated the question this way. School start and end times. What times below do you want the high schools to use? As you can see, given these choices, roughly four out of 10 students surveyed indicated they preferred to keep things the same with our current 7.20 a.m. to 2.05 p.m. school day. Of the almost 60% that wanted a change, most opted for the 8 a.m. to 2.45 p.m. school day. We know the school board is continuing to study this issue, and we hope these results will be of some help to you. Last spring's town hall meetings also drew a lot of student interest in the topic of the dress code. And so we began this question by simply asking, do you think the school dress code is fair? As you can see, one third of the respondents indicated they believe current policy is fair, with two thirds saying they believe it is not. This question was long since we wanted to obtain more specific information from students who do not think the dress code is fair. So we next asked, if no above, please complete for your gender below. And so, for any males responding to this question who did not think this dress code was fair, we asked them to circle the one item that they felt was most unfair out of the four choices given in items A through D as shown, or write in whatever else it was that most bothered them. I'll pause briefly to allow you to read these. We also asked females who are dissatisfied with the dress code's fairness to answer what their single biggest concern was. Oh, excuse me. What their single biggest concern was, as indicated here. Please note that item choices C through E were the same for either gender. In the history of our cafeteria mini surveys, the second part of this question about dress code fairness turned out to be most unusual. We decided we could not present statistics on this since so many students who were dissatisfied marked their gender <coughs> responses with more than one answer. This was possibly the result of confusion from poor question design and or it was a hot button for many students who could not confine their dissatisfaction to only one item. Whatever the case may be, we would only offer a few observations and one recommendation here. First, a clear majority of students believe the dress code is unfair. Second, in spite of possible confusion from the way things were worded here, many of the comments were so heartfelt that we believe this is a very important issue to some students. 
It appears to run deep with many individuals and may even be a cause for some poor morale and perhaps mistrust. Third, and perhaps surprisingly, there seems to be a significant feeling of gender bias against females and how the dress code policy is enforced. In fact, many males indicated this, including some that thought the dress code was fair to begin with. This all leads us to the suggestion, if it hasn't been tried yet, that the student dress code be further explored in student focus groups, where feelings can be articulated in greater depth. Perhaps if students had more ownership and the opportunity to fully express their opinions, they would at least respect the fact that the enforcement of the policy was fair, even if they disagreed with aspects of the policy. Hi, my name is Hannah Stratton, and I'm a senior at York High School. In closing, we want to mention some upcoming opportunities for students. First, the issue of bullying is a topic that past youth commissions have surveyed and reported to the Board of Supervisors and School Board. Both boards have encouraged the Youth Commission to pursue this. We are very excited about a special event we are planning for this spring along with the teen leaders from the Victory Family YMCA. In fact, we went to the YMCA earlier in the year to meet with their staff and teen leaders. We are still regularly meeting with them to further discuss our plans. More information about this event will be announced within the next few weeks. If the school division would like to partner in this event as well, we would love to have your support. There is still time to nominate deserving high school students living in the county for one of the 2016 Outstanding Youth Award Scholarships. These are sponsored each year by the Board of Supervisors and the Youth Commission. They recognize exceptional character and achievement in four different categories, community service, compassion, courage, and overall achievement. Literally anyone can nominate someone they respect for one of these awards, including family members, friends, teachers, coaches, club sponsors, counselors, and youth workers. Nominations must be received at Parks, Recreation, and Tourism by February 17th. One recipient will be named for each category. Each of the four recipients will receive a $500 educational scholarship once they graduate from high school and enroll in either a college or trade school. A dinner reception for the recipients, their families, and nominators will be held in May. Afterwards, recipients will be recognized at a Board of Supervisors meeting. However, all nominees will receive a letter and certificate from the Board congratulating them on their nomination and informing them of their nominator. We also want to encourage any current 8th through 11th grade students living in the county to consider applying for next year's Youth Commission. Those applications are due at Parks, Recreation, and Tourism by no later than March 9th. Interested students and their parents are invited to attend the February 9th Youth Commission meeting to get a feel for what it's like and to ask any questions they may have. Applicants are not required to attend this meeting, but those that can are free to come anytime between 6 and 7.30 p.m. to the Yorktown Library off of Route 17, where this particular meeting will be held. Finally, anyone interested in either of the two items just mentioned can find the details and forms they need online at the York County Youth Commission's website at www.ycyc.info. If anyone has any questions, please call the Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Office at 890-3500. In closing, Mr. Chair, on behalf of my colleagues on the Youth Commission, we would again like to thank you sincerely for this opportunity to report to you and our fellow students tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions of these? I would just Fine like to say sweet. thank you. To I really appreciate your coming here and sharing your survey results with us, especially the ones on school start time as well as the one on the dress code. I know every time I go to the Grafton Town Hall Forum, um, that's the, the hot topic issue, and I think it's very important, and I'm very proud of you for bringing that issue to us because there, I know that the students have great concern about the fairness and enforcement of the dress code policy, and I think that uh, is probably an area where maybe we could work together and see um, what kind of, how we could conform the dress code from high school to high school and make sure that it is uh, fair and appropriate. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, good information. Okay. All right. <clears throat> 
The second item under presentations this evening has to do with our construction report. And Dr. Shander, would you like to lead into yes, that? Yes, thank you, Dr. George. Board members, now I'm going to ask Mr. Mark Shearhart, Associate Director of Capital Plans and Projects, to come forward to present the construction report for the month. Mr. Chairman, members of the board and Dr. Shandor, <coughs> here's your capital projects report <clears throat> from the month of January. Uh, we have been busy. The contractor has been very busy at Magruder Elementary School. They were very busy last summer, and we, that work continued on to, the, to this winter break. Uh, during, the four, during the winter break, there were four aspects of work that did uh, in Magruder. Uh, first of these is uh, renovating or, or doing partial changes to the large restrooms there. Uh, replacing the sinks in those bathrooms or those restrooms and replacing uh, the hand dryers with energy, uh, faster, more energy efficient hand dryers. The existing sinks did not have any hot water to them, so we installed some sinks that had self contained water heaters in them. The second aspect of this project was uh, replacing the hot water heater for the kitchen. Mm -hmm. It was an old, inefficient electric tank type water heater. We replaced this with uh, the contractor, replaced this with two high efficiency gas tankless hot water heaters. So much more uh, efficient uh, uh, hot water for the kitchen. Third aspect of this was the, the windows in the original building. The seals had failed on most of those windows, and so the there was moisture between the, the window panes. <clears throat> this reduced the energy efficiency of those windows and also was, a, was an eyesore. So the contractor replaced all of the windows in the two weeks of spring break. Uh, <clears throat> now, it rained most of the time, but because there was an overhang, over the windows, they were able to, even though they were getting wet, the windows were going in. So um, the, the last aspect of this uh, winter project was, uh, was painting the class, the addition classrooms. These classrooms were not part of the scope of, pa of painting the last in the summer. And so the 12 addition classrooms were painted. Uh, and the teachers are very excited about that, very happy. They're nice and bright now. Uh, and uh, they also they look very similar to the rest of the rest of the building. There's the same color scheme throughout the building. So here's some pictures. This is the original sinks and the hand dryers there. Uh, the box in the corner there was one of the new hand dryers. Uh, and here's what the new sinks look like in the new hand dryers. So the kids, the children, students are very very happy with this new setup. This is a picture of the uh, tankless water heaters here for the for the kitchen. So we should have a very efficient and uh, endless supply of hot water to that kitchen. The next project I'd like to focus on is Walla Mill Elementary School, and this is the additions and renovations at that school. That work has been going on. The, the contractor planned to get a lot of work done during the, uh, during the winter break, but uh, due to the rain, he only was able to work about one or two days there, so there was some uh, weather delays at that site. The footers or the concrete bases for the gymnasium and the classroom wing are complete and they began construction of the foundation walls at both of those, both those wings. The existing building, building renovation will take place starting in June and going through December, and this is a very tight construction schedule for the additions as well as the, the uh, renovating the existing building. Here's the, uh, a picture of the uh, foundation walls for the gymnasium itself in the upper portion of the picture. And to the right-hand side, lower portion of the picture is where the, the new, two new classrooms would be at for art and for music. This picture here is the classroom addition out of the back of the building. Uh, you can see here the uh, foundation walls are also in place here. And you, if you look real closely, you can see uh, an electrician there working out there putting the conduit in. <laughs> Once the conduit, underground conduit is in place for, the elect for electrical wiring, and the, uh, and the plumbing is in place, they can go ahead and pour the concrete uh, floor in, that, in these, uh, both of these wings here and, and then start building the building up from there. The last slide I have focuses on two schools, and this is Bethel Manor and Yorktown Elementary School. As you, as you remember from past meetings, Bethel Manor Elementary School was renovating the three and 400 hallways. This re is, uh, included replacing the heating and air conditioning, the lights, the ceilings, the windows, and the roof on the, both of those hallways. And Yorktown Elementary School involved replacing the heating and air conditioning throughout the building, except for the uh, new wing, and also um, expanding the cafeteria and also replacing part of the roof. Now, we've been trying to, we've, 
the process for obtaining a design architect and engineer for these two schools started slightly before uh, the, uh, the uh, Board of Supervisors approved funding for this project, but the, uh, <coughs> as soon as we received the uh, pr uh, authorization to, um, for the funding, uh, a RFP or request for proposals was put out on the street for to soliciting, soliciting uh, proposals from the architects and engineers for the design of these, of these two projects. This, during this process, we received a set of proposals from multiple architectural and engineering firms. We evaluated those, those, architect, those uh, proposals and selected three firms for the short list. Out of those, th a, out of those three firms, a five-member team interviewed those three firms and recommending, uh, recommended awarding uh, the project or a contract to the winning firm. We have been, uh, we have, uh, contract documents were sent to this firm and we have been in ongoing discussions with this firm over the contract wording, contract language, and this has taken longer than anticipated uh, to resolve, but these, these, con these concerns have now been resolved. With the exception of the design completion date and construction completion date for both schools, the contract is ready to be signed. However, based on the information I've given you and the time required for the architectural and engineering design, our recommendation is to begin the design phase of the project as soon as the contract is signed, but to move the construction phase of the project from September, uh, from summer of 2016 to summer of 2017. The moving of the construction at York Elementary on the building will not delay the installation of the modular classroom at Yorktown Elementary and or the 15 additional parking spaces. Again, I say moving the construction phase of the building itself will not delay the installation of the modular classroom unit or the 15 additional parking spots at Yorktown Elementary School. So who has the first question? I got a number of them. Um, but I guess the first question, Mr. Shearhart, is so the public can understand a little bit more about the process and where the delays were actually centered. Um, I know in some aspects of con the contract world, things go back and forth quite a bit. Um, but before I get to my next question, can you explain a little bit more detailed about, okay, once the short list is created, now this started back in May of last year, Yes. Um, but once we move past and we get to that short list and then a committee recommends a particular company to award the project to or projects, contracts begin, where does that contract negotiation bounce around. I mean well, the contract then the contract documents are sent to the, the architect or the architectural firm. They review them and then if they have any concerns with document wording or construction or the contract wording, contract language, then they will come back to us and we we can they can propose they sometimes they propose different changes. We can either accept those changes or reject them and we sometimes send back a proposal to them what they will, you know, what, to see what they will accept. And so we've gone back and forth a couple of times to resolve this. My next question is based on past practice of our construction projects that we've, we've been really good about adding on to our buildings, renovating our buildings, doing things um, with our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, knowing past practice of timelines and how we follow those to have that window of construction wasn't that, I mean, who's telling us that this project can't be done in the window where things are now based well, the, on? The meeting we had on the 26th of this month, they told us that just it, the engineering for the mechanical systems alone would take five months. That's just for the mechanical systems. For an engineer to do their work, their, That's correct. Their, their blueprints, I guess, their plans. Their plans, right, and run it through. They have to do the design. Once the design is done, it incorporates it with the architect's designs. That it has to then go to um, go to building regulations. Has to be approved by building regulations. Right. Uh, specifications have to be written. 
I assume that we know these timelines exist. So yes. would it be I'm trying to figure out how to word this question. When the process was moving along and we're you're in the middle of all this and staff is wrapping around it, county staff is involved, county purchase is involved. Um at what someone at some point must have known that we're squeezing the time frame here. We're going to run out of time. We're, we're not going to get this. This needs to be done. Things need to move a little quicker. Um, did that start to happen in your world? Typically what happens is the, con the architects, they know that there's going to be time to get a contract signed. They, they know they've got to get documentation. They've got an insurance documentation, <laughs> diff different things they have to get along with the contract. And they know that that all takes time. And typically, in the past, most architects sit down with us and they start designing the building. We had we had preliminary meetings with the contract with the architects and the engineers multiple times. We were sending documents, sending drawings back and forth. We were sending floor plans back and forth. And, a, and uh, typically, that's what happens while they know the contract is in process. And so then, typically, they have a good footprint done before. The, uh, before the contract is even signed. I mean, once they, once they have the contract signed, then they'll start releasing documents to us, construction documents. But is, th that did not happen in this, this, this instance. Is this a company we've used before? This company did the uh, design of uh, Tab Elementary, Tab Middle School, Tab, excuse me, Tab Middle School. They did the design of Queens Lake Middle School. They also did the design of Bethel Manor Elementary School. I'm going to have further questions later on. I don't want to take the whole evening of asking so many questions. Um, we all know what Magruder and York Elementary Schools are faced with. We, we know what's, what the wave looks like. It's already here with the growth in those two districts. I hope that we can step back from this moment and evaluate our process and evaluate how we do things, um, working with county purchasing or code and compliance or other divisions that are not under our roof so that we know as we push up against things, okay, this isn't going to happen or this, we need to move a little faster, a little quicker on this or that. What can we do to, so that we don't end up in this situation? Um, because now we're, we're dealing with, yes, the mobiles will be there on time and set up and ready to go. I hope, I mean, I really, hope that goes the way it's, it's supposed to go um, with dealing with code and compliance and things like that. But we don't want a dare elementary school fiasco either. So I'm glad that we had the four, you know, that somebody came forward and said, we're not going to be able to do this project. You end up having all kinds of stuff happening. So we need to slow it down or, or delay it. But at the same time, it doesn't help Yorktown Elementary School. It doesn't help Bethel Manor. Bethel Manor is a little bit more can survive this, where Yorktown Elementary is going to have a little bit more challenges on dealing with it. So um, don't like it, but I just know that we're having to deal with it. So I have a um, where do we go from here as far as um, Yorktown Elementary School when you're talking about the delay of the construction, you're talking about the delay of uh, the expansion of the cafeteria. So what do we do in September when we start school and we have uh, additional students from what we already have attending Yorktown Elementary? What do we do about their lunch periods? Um, how, the cafeteria is small right now. It doesn't really accommodate the uh, enrollment that is at Yorktown Elementary. And this may not be for you, but what do we do? We need to, I feel like we need to start planning now so um, we're prepared. As soon as we knew this information, we shared it. That's what, so that, because we knew how much of an impact this was going to be. But we are, and here comes yeah, Dr. James. Dr. Okay, James. that would be great because this is now out of our control, but planning for September is still in our control as to what we do uh, for their lunch periods. Right. What we'll have to do is work with Ms. Denny and her staff on what's an appropriate time for students to have lunch based on the students that are enrolled. We have several projections out there about enrollment next year at Yorktown Elementary. Hopefully this will be the year of the really increased growth that we didn't see. When I looked at my projections and the county planners projections for Yorktown Elementary School, we see enrollment to be similar to what it is right now. 
But this is something, of course, we're going to have to evaluate and then come up with an appropriate schedule based on student enrollment and what the needs of the school are when it comes to getting students through the cafeteria. What time do they start lunch right now? I believe it, if my memory serves me correctly, it's about 1045, which is earlier than most elementary schools and it's later because of the fact that you just mentioned the size of the cafeteria and the student enrollment. 1045 and when do they end lunch? Uh, and I'm guessing <laughs> without remembering, it's sometime after one o'clock I do believe. And that's just a guess on what I had discussions back in the fall with Denny about the length of her lunch periods. But it is a challenge for the school, I, I do realize. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Sure, you're um, welcome. And one, Dr. George, if I may, just, I don't know, Barbara, you, your district is dealing with this too. <coughs> whatever, once again, the question is, whatever we can do as a school board um, inside the building today, um, whether it's to, whether they need equipment, whether they need um, additional bodies, whether it's um, additional furniture, I mean, whatever resource, I mean, I know you're in contact with the principal and the staff. We got the four classrooms up, no, six classrooms up and rolling now that are out, and we got hopefully four more that will arrive and be set up. But I guess just that cafeteria, the media center, just other areas that are common areas, if there's any way that we can just find if there's a issue, especially with for this period of now an extra year, um, what do we need to do? If they need something, I hope they ask. I hope they're not hesitant to ask of staff. We may not be able to do it, but at least we can look at it and evaluate it. And if it is something that is doable, whether it's um, panels in the cafeteria to lessen the you know, noise in there or whatever it may be, just working with the principal like you do now. Right. Mr. Murphy, you're exactly right. As we have discussion with Mrs. Denny, her staff, and of course the community, whatever their concerns are and whatever their desires are, we'll see what's possible at that school to help with this situation. You are exactly right. You know, I feel as though the things we're talking about now, we can control because it's under our roof. My concern is a takeoff mark of where you were. We, are, we had, you said three firms we looked at and we awarded to one. I'm looking down the road because now we have a change in our CIP, which we had it laid out how we wanted to approach it. I'm concerned about the future and will things stay on target with the firm we've selected based on this. An important part of this is the timing to get the contract documents done, get approval through the county staff, and then put the project out for, for bid from contractors. And then the contractors need time to get their subcontractors. And we can establish a project timeline based on the constraints of when we need the school. A lot of times when we get into this, we have to look at when the, say, Wall of Mail, for instance, what's an appropriate transition period in the summer. Unfortunately, we're faced with a very short timeline in the, in the summer to get this work done. The time of year that you place a project out for bid also dictates the contractor that's available and the subs that are available. Sometimes as this goes out later in the spring, we know that you are going to look at contractors perhaps have not been selected by anyone else or the subcontractors. So when it comes to managing this project and keeping a project online with the quality that we want, I think we'll, the recommendation is not to force through the summer because the majority of the quality contractors and subcontractors have now been selected by someone else. So that's an important thing to consider when you're trying to push projects through because I'm thinking about how is it going to end and what's going to happen along the way so we get the quality that we want for that community rather than get someone that be less than desirable to try to complete this project. So part of that is in play. Another reason we're working with this firm, part of what they need to do is do the civil drawings for that plan, for that particular school. And the civil drawings that have to be approved by the county <laughs> would be the placement of the trailers and also the drawings for the parking space. So that part needs to go ahead and go ahead first we need to get that in place so we can move forward with the trailers, and then we need to get into the, the design. And when you go through a design, 
the architect is going to design the building. The mechanical engineer, the mechanical firm, has to design the HVAC and all those systems to make it compatible with what we have. So we're talking about something that you just can't do overnight. There has to be a lot of coordination and review to make sure we have a plant with HVAC and those mechanical systems mm -hmm. that are going to work in accordance with the design. So it's more than just the architect that's involved, it's mechanical systems as well, as well as the civil engineer to get this project where we want to have it. I so those are some of the issues we are facing along the way to get this project off the ground. And that's, the, I guess, part of the, the, what's getting under my fingernail is that we know that. We know that. Y'all know that. So we should have known this part was starting to happen probably before now. Um, a couple of last things. One question is this does not change the CIP dollars that have been allocated and budgeted for for these projects, that they're not being um, maneuvered or moved based on the county's decision or anything. The dollars are in place for these projects. Right. This was approved as part of last year's CIP for FY16 okay. for this fiscal year. So we have those dollars. Okay. We could not and even start to award the contract to an A&E firm, architectural and engineering firm, without the dollars. So all of that's in place. We have to have that in place before we can go out right. to actually hire an architect or hire a subcontractor to put all this in place. But we're not going to lose those dollars. We're not going to lose so those dollars. So they'll stay in place in the plan, right. so, okay. Right. okay. Lastly, and I think this is important, I don't know if we can do this, well, two things. Um, one is, for transparency purposes, the communities of Barbara, the Magruder District, and my district specifically, using our website to put detail. <coughs> I'm talking about like when the first discussions began with this project, whether it was May of 2015, at what point did the RFP hit the street, what, what point did the, you know, the, the uh, short list was created. I mean, just time points so that if someone has a, you know, what happened, how does this process work, they can see that so that it just, it doesn't, it doesn't excuse it it just makes it maybe a little bit easier for someone to understand and then as we create more timelines or we start having more timelines created as projects move forward especially in these two districts we could add that to the list so that people can say okay this one's forecasted out to be you know, started here estimated completion date I mean just things like that we can put on our website um, because if we're going to have especially the new school coming online eventually um, I think it's important for the community to know that. And lastly, I would just encourage Dr. Shandor, um, have some really, um, I call them, I guess, come to Jesus meetings with the county administrator and really has just voiced the fact that, I mean, this board member here is very concerned, very concerned. Um, this shouldn't be. That's all I can say. It just shouldn't. We shouldn't be in this position right now. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joy. Don't want to take away from any of this. Uh, just had a statement, and Dr. James, Mr. Shearhart, <coughs> unless you've been in the engineering field and dealt with one of these projects and realize all you have to go through with permits and the civil engineers and the mechanical people, it'd be hard to really understand it. But I've been there, and I understand, and I know you're doing the best you can, and I'm sure they will speed this up, and I appreciate all the comments. I know at the New Horizon Special Education Building, we couldn't get the water turned on. It was simply as going out there and turning the meter on, and it would took forever to get that done. And, and I guess my question is, have you had any contact with New Horizons? They were supposed to get a permit of occupancy, I think, last week for the special ed building. Tried to coach, I tried to go contact Joe Johnson today, and I was not able to contact him. Okay. I was trying to find out. Yeah, I think everything's question. moving along. I saw some pictures of the room and everything he showed and, uh, recently, and uh, we was real pleased with that. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot to add. Y'all have done a good job. Um, I think this is a multi-layered problem that's uh, between the funding of the CIP, the new construction that's taken place in York County that's ongoing, um, causing growth in certain parts of the county. It's almost like the perfect storm. And 
and I know it's frustrating. I see all of y'all over there fanning yourselves. Um, it, it's just a, a bad situation, and, and we know that. Um, I think, just like my board members have said, we need to just bump this up about 10 notches and make sure that this gets uh, absolutely priority and our full attention and we stay, as well as the public stays informed on this uh, very, very, uh, very much each and every, every day. Okay, at this point, we're gonna enter our public participation at board meetings. For anybody that has signed up, um, just like to remind you, you have three minutes to speak. Uh, please be mindful of that by the lights here on the front of the, the podium. Um, state your name and address. And anybody that did not have a chance to speak and did not sign up, you'll have a chance to do so at the end of the meeting. My very first person I would like to call up is this young man right here, this, this Boy Scout. I asked him earlier if it was okay, and he assured me that he was, that it was. So uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your troop and what, what you're here for this evening. Okay, um, first off, my name's Cameron Harlow. I'm the senior patroller with Troop 915 Hampton, Virginia. Um, one of the main reasons why I'm out here is um, for one of my last merit badges is citizenship in the community. And this is an Eagle required merit badge and one of the last ones that I need to get done for my Eagle Scout, pro or for my Eagle Scout, so. That's awesome. Congratulations. Awesome, congratulations. Um, so, when, how long has it taken this process of Eagle Scout by the time from beginning to end? How many, how many years you reckon that's gonna be? Um, well, I've been with scouting since I was in Cub Scouts. I was a Tiger Scout when I first started. So I've been scouting for a little, about 11 years now. Um, I'm starting to get down to um, the clock. I have 11 months, or less than 11 months, to get everything turned in for my Eagle Scout um, and get a project finished up and everything like that. So my clock's ticking right now. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> well, great. We wish you all the luck and, uh, Thank and success. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> First up to speak is Delphia Rawls Hedgepeth. Good evening, Dr. Shandor, Dr. George, and other members of the school board. <clears throat> My name is Delphia Rawls Hedgepeth, and I reside at 202 York V Road, Yorktown, Virginia. First, I would like to commend you for the work that you do for the children of our community and for the time you spend doing it. Our family moved to York County from Hampton in October 1977, primarily because of the quality of public education available to our three daughters. At that time, we had a daughter in second grade and one in fourth grade at YES, and a daughter in the ninth grade, York High School. They each received a wonderful and quality educational experience in York County schools. And now, <clears throat> as adults, they have all chosen to live in York County and enroll their children in York County schools. Currently, I have three grandchildren at Yorktown Elementary, two at Yorktown Middle, and two at York High. So I'm here tonight to advocate on behalf of those seven grandchildren and the other students in these schools. You need to know that I have been an advocate for quality public, public education my entire adult life as a teacher, as the PTA president at Yorktown Elementary in 1980, and currently as a member of the League of Women Voters and the American Association of University to Women. I advocate at the local level, the state level, and at the national level. My particular concern tonight is to urge you to immediately turn your attention to the certain ripple effect of the overcrowding at Yorktown Elementary School upon Yorktown Middle School and subsequently York High School. My request is that you, with Dr. Shandor, form a task force now to prevent any adverse effects from occurring at those two schools from the current overcrowding at Yorktown Elementary and 
from the anticipated further increase in enrollment due to the new developments already approved in the county. Your job is made more difficult with the reality that since 2009, 2008 and 2009, state funding on a per pupil inflation adjusted basis has decreased from $4,275 at that time to approximately $3,655 today. Unless and until we can persuade the General Assembly to change that funding level, you will have to find a way to do more with less. I thank you again for your dedication to continuing to providing a high quality public education to the children of York County. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. David Forrest. My name is David Forrest, and I live at 104 Three Point Court in Yorktown here. Uh, my comments are on Yorktown Elementary as well. Um, and since the 2008-2009 school year, Yorktown Elementary's fall enrollment has increased 35%. In raw numbers, that's 185 students, which is the largest increase in any of the schools. The last redistricting in 2009 was responsible for adding 73 of those students to Yorktown Elementary, and since then, 112 more have been added. Over the same time, the adjacent schools, Magruder, Dare, Seaford, have all decreased by decreased enrollment by 144 students. Looking at the enrollment versus the capacity of the elementary schools, Wallermill stands out with the 18 students over capacity, while Yorktown is at 97% of capacity with 21 empty seats. While the other elementary schools have two to 10 rooms worth of excess capacity, Yorktown is less than one. Excess capacity helps calm the school by providing buffer zones, quiet areas, storage, and flexibility, and prevents issues like displacing the magnet school teachers onto push carts, as was done at Yorktown Elementary this year. Yorktown Elementary has picked up most of the growth, most of the growth in the past, and is projected to pick up most of the future growth. The interim plan presented to increase the capacity of York County concentrates the growth at Yorktown Elementary by shuffling the Head Start trailer and adding a modular building. This module building would come from the Tidewater Community College at Chesapeake's uh, CT1 building, one that uh, the Provost Lisa Ryan there was happy to have her hauled off off-site back in May. As the biggest elementary school, Yorktown Elementary should have the highest level of resources. With a high proportion of free, reduced lunch students and the magnet school status, it demands significantly higher resources than average. Average staffing for a challenging situation won't produce good results. Over this same time period, Yorktown Elementary's quality on greatschools.org has dropped to a five, while the other York Elementary schools rate eights and nines. As it is, it seems the only folks moving to Yorktown will be the ones that are ordered to move here, and we will school them in the overcrowded trailers. What should we do about it? Capacity and redistricting should be pre both prepared for for any eventuality by September 1st, so we aren't putting our teachers in push carts on the hallways and giving our students a subpar education. That's my comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tressa Allenbach. Good evening. My name is Tressa Allenbach. I'm a mother to a sixth grader and a ninth grader here at TAB. I wish I could find a handsome Boy Scout, but he's my neighbor. <laughs> um, I'm here because when my daughter started high school, I was surprised to see that she would, did not have the opportunity to enroll in an honors biology class and next year she will not have the opportunity to enroll in an honors chemistry class. I work at a neighboring school district and I know for a fact that our students do have this opportunity. Therefore, I researched other districts in the area and was sad to find out that every single one offers an honors biology or an honors chemistry for ninth and 10th grade students. I'm not talking AP, I'm talking regular biology and chemistry. The only district that has a curriculum similar to your county would be Portsmouth. The second goal for your county is to provide students an engaging and rigorous educational experience. I really don't think this is happening given th sixth grade through 11th grade, our students do not have the opportunity to take an honors or, or advanced science class. I contacted VDOE and asked them to tell me based on the master schedule collection, which is a collection that's done twice a year for every district in the state, how many districts in Virginia offer an honors and a, honors chem a biology and an honors chemistry class. 
The numbers they gave me were very upsetting. Over 90% of the districts in Virginia offer an honors biology class and an honors chemistry class. Your county is one of a few who does not. And it's not just within Virginia. Dr. Shandor, I looked at the last two districts you were at, and they also offer honors biology and honors chemistry to their students. Back in 1999, a group of your county teachers, science teachers, got together to propose these classes, and they were denied. Around three to four years ago, another group of science teachers got together, put together a program of studies, and they presented this. And everybody who's on the board is on this, and Dr. Guy is on this. Dr. Shadow, this is for you to see that these science teachers are interested in an honors biology class. They are also interested in an honors chemistry class. They were denied, but what's sad is they were denied with no explanation. I've talked to some of these teachers. They do not know why this was denied. They want to see it. Parents want to see it. Students want to see this. I find it sad and frustrating that your county is one of a few districts who does not offer honors biology and honors chemistry class. I'm not here to ask if, they're go if you're going to. I'm asking when you're going to. I know it's too late for my older daughter, but hopefully it'll be in time for my younger daughter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Caroline Hareth. Caroline Hareth, 306 Artillery Road, Yorktown, Virginia, 23692. Superintendent Shandor, Mr. Chairman, and members of the school board, I'm here tonight to request that you rezone the new residential communities that are currently zoned for Yorktown Elementary School. I have been an active parent volunteer at Yorktown Elementary School for eight years. During this time, I've seen the impact of a 35% rise in student population on class sizes, on the number of classes per grade, on infrastructure and common spaces, like the cafeteria, which is the smallest in the county, and on staff. Most importantly, as a classroom volunteer, over this time I've seen the impact on my children and on other students, as each teacher's time has been split between more and more students. I can see that the achievement gap that you all have worked so hard to address is widening. I understand that there are many challenges, and I thank you for your commitment to getting the modular units from TCC retrofitted and open for students at YES before the first day of school this fall. The modular classrooms are only part of the solution, though. They will only hold 100 students, which is less than the county's estimated number of elementary school age students at four new developments in the Yorktown Elementary Zone. Moreover, what happens if the modular units don't have occupancy permits by September 6th? It was hard enough for the math and science resource teachers to be on cards this year until November 19th, but what will you do with classrooms of students and teachers if those four modular classrooms aren't available when school starts? I'm certain that every effort will be made, but let's be realistic and have a backup plan, knowing that things happen to delay construction projects. The logical answer is to rezone the new developments to balance capacity between schools, which is something that most of you stated you would support during your campaigns last fall. The simple ones to rezone are the ones that don't have any students in them yet. For example, Yorktown Crescent behind Wendy's could be rezoned now for DARE, which could easily accommodate the 27 projected students. In addition, I ask that you look at residential communities like Yorktown Arch that had students starting this year and rezone them to Seaford or DARE. My comments are not about the new developments themselves. They're about numbers of students that could be easily rezoned for another school and transported to that school. I think that all students deserve a great education, no matter where they live in your county and or in what kind of home they reside. In conclusion, I know that you're working to deal with the situation that the Board of Supervisors has created. Rezoning should be part of that solution, particularly in light of the construction delay that was announced tonight. I ask that you consider rezoning the new residential developments and that you let us know your plans by April so that we can plan accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Julie Bednarik, sorry if I mispronounced it. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Shandor. My name is Julie Bednarik, and I live at 203 Blevins Run, Yorktown, Virginia, 23693. I am here tonight to continue to urge you to research the many advantages to our students 
of a return to a traditional school start time of 8 a.m. or later for our high school students. I further urge you, after completing your research, to implement this change. The primary reason to change to a traditional high school start time is because doing so reduces sleep deprivation in our students, which leads to improved physical and emotional health, as well as improved cognitive function, all of which in turn lead to improved school performance. To specifically address the topic of improved physical health of our students, I will share one important example of how a change to a traditional school start time can impact a community. In a 2007-2008 study of teen drivers in Virginia Beach, where high school start times were between 7.20 and 7.25 a.m., which is, as we all know, the time our students begin high school classes, the crash rate was an astounding 41% higher than in nearby Chesapeake, where high school classes started between 8.40 and 8.45 a.m. The results of this study were confirmed by a follow-up study in 2009 to 2011. Cutting teen driving accidents almost in half simply by delaying school start times is a compelling reason to change our high school start time to a more traditional time. Please examine again the research at schoolstarttime.org regarding the negative physical, emotional, and performance issues that arise from sleep deprivation in teens, and in particular, the study by O'Malley and O'Malley, which shows that the later school start time for high school students led to an average of 40 more minutes sleep per school night. This is significant as the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends an average of nine hours of sleep per night for teenagers, but a 2011 study by the National Sleep Foundation showed that only 14% of students aged 13 to 18 met that requirement. The American Academy of Pediatrics feels so strongly about the problem of sleep deprivation in teens and the health issues it causes that they issued a policy statement in 2014 in support of delaying school start times. As when I stood before you this past November speaking on this same topic, again tonight I implore you to consider that the advantages of a change to a more traditional high school start time of after 8 a.m outweigh any concerns that a proposed change may, may raise. Let's align our high school start time to better mesh with the natural sleep cycles of teens to help our students sleep better, have improved physical and emotional health, fewer driving accidents, improved cognitive function, and better school performance. Thank you very much for your time and thoughtful consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Williams. Karen White. Oh, there we go. Good evening. My name is Karen Williams, and I reside at 117 Sheldon Court, Yorktown, Virginia. I'm a board-certified family medicine physician, and I'd like for you to consider the medical science involved and regarding more traditional school start times. Many of you, like myself, may be able to recount a tired teenager in your life. Uh, typically, their physical signs, maybe their posture is poor, they're sagging, dragging, but also they're um, often less attentive, alert, less engaged, and often a little more grumpy and a little more likely to have altercations with their siblings, quite honestly. This is especially uh, important because the typical response of parents is to say, hey, tonight you're going to bed on time. I mean it. You need to get more sleep. This just has to stop. Well, unfortunately, it's not that simple because there's science behind the sleep-wake cycles of teenagers, especially teenagers who are in puberty. Developmentally, their sleep-wake sleep -wake cycle is shifted a little bit later, if you will. Their natural rhythms are to stay up later and, as a result, sleep in the next morning. Certainly, there are lifestyle choices that contribute to this if they're involved in after-school sports or uh, a job after school. Certainly, academic demands can also um, 
contribute to not enough sleep. And often going to bed earlier, sometimes it's just not enough. Uh, how I can recount times that my own teenager has gone to bed, or so I thought, but failed to fall asleep because she just couldn't. So consider that same teenager in school, tired, <coughs> resting their heads, less attentive, less engaged in what's happening in the classroom, and naturally there are going to be consequences, academically and even athletically. In 2014, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a policy statement regarding school, st school start times and their recommendations to allow 8.5 to 9.5 hours per night of rest. Those studies show the benefits of later school start times, mentally less depression, more attentive and improved focus, physically less obesity and improved athletic performance, academically improved performance, and in regards to safety, less fender benders, if you will. Please, as you consider the issue, the medical science supports later start times for our York County students. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Howe. Good evening. My name is Kathleen Howe. I live at 121 Lanceway, Yorktown, Virginia, 23693. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the school board, and Dr. Shandor. I would like to thank the board for listening and hearing us the past three months concerning a more traditional school start time. I understand you move forward with the RFP, which is a request for proposal concerning this matter. However, I have been unable to find it on the York County government site to learn more about the RFP and what you are all requesting. I do hope you move this forward quickly so it moves us one step closer to a more traditional school start time. If it does, I will support your efforts. We hope this gets posted soon so medical professionals can submit their proposals. Parents and students from various school districts support this cause and will continue to watch your televised work sessions and attend the public sessions to monitor its progress. As stated earlier this evening by the York Commission, 59% uh, it came out to 59% of our students prefer starting school at 8 a.m. or later, as opposed to the 41% who like it the way it is now. What we need to do is take a look. 59% is a huge majority of students who are dissatisfied with getting up early in the morning, perhaps even falling asleep because of their academic workload and study habits and all the projects that they have coming in. This is excluding the seniors who are sitting there now, in addition to all of this, worrying about volunteer hours and getting into a good college. Julie Bednarik also stated in 2007, 2008, there were 41,000 fewer teens involved in crashes in Chesapeake than in Virginia Beach. Why was this? Because Chesapeake actually started school an hour to an hour and 20 minutes later than Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach starts school anywhere from 720 to 725, much like our students. Wouldn't it be nice if we could decrease the number of teen drivers involved in accidents here within your county? No one wants to be in an accident, let alone hear that your child, loved one, family, or friends are involved in one. I, for one, would like to make a difference in a teen's life or perhaps one of those we love, and I know you do too. Thank you for your attention concerning the more traditional school start times and for hearing and listening to your constituents and students 
We look forward to seeing this progress evolve. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Natalie Hall. Good evening, Dr. Shandor, members of the board. My name is Natalie Hall, and I think I've stood up here before you, and I've met several of you and been on the phone with several of you before, but I live at 117 Runaway Lane in Yorktown, and I have two boys that are currently in York County Schools. We moved here in 2010 and placed them in Yorktown Elementary when it was run by Dr., well, Mr. Lombardo and uh, Jeff Getz, Kevin Getz. And in those years that we've been there, uh, we've seen a lot of changes, and we understand that there's a lot of different things that go on at a different level. Um, you know, we're moving our kids around based on where the schools are, and we hear all the comments from our friends that they also moved to York County for the schools. Um, you know, we are retired military, and we had the benefit of looking around and finding the right place for our boys to be raised. Um, after looking at six different neighborhoods on the peninsula, four different school districts, touring through four different elementary schools, talking to different people, we landed at Yorktown Elementary. And in the very short time that we were here, to see it change so much, um, it's, it's out of our control, it's out of our hands. Um, there, it's almost as if everybody is on a bus and the driver is asleep at the wheel and they are headed over a cliff. It's a crisis mode, and I don't think that any of you fully understand what it's like to be a parent of a child at Yorktown Elementary. And I, I, I really would urge you to consider rezoning immediately because this is not a new problem that's cropped up overnight. It is something that's been in the works for many years. When, you, when I talk to some of the lifers that are in my neighborhood who've been here, who have children that have moved away and had their own children. It is the same drum, the same beat. There is overcrowding and it is continuing and it's getting worse. We look to you and we expect change. With the swipe of a pen, with special sessions, whatever it takes, we, the parents of Yorktown Elementary, expect great things to happen among these members. And if I could just say that we are totally committed, it's not like we don't bring something to the table. We bring more to the table every day. We have a group of parents that are very concerned. Our numbers are growing, and we appreciate any effort that you can make to make an impact on their daily life. When you go into the school board in the morning, when you get out of your car, I want you to think about Yorktown Elementary. And I want you to think about what the kids are going through. There's no blacktop to play on. There's more change in their future than I would ever want for them at an elementary age. There's chaos. They can't even be in the lunchroom all at the same time. Please consider them when you make your daily agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Randy Hall. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Randy Hall. I live at 117 Runaway Lane. Uh, Dr. Shander, Dr. George, board members, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, I also want to speak on behalf of Yorkton Elementary School as a concerned parent, a citizen, a taxpayer, and a voter. So, uh, like my wife had mentioned, you know, we came here in 2010. We bring two boys who, who, who genuinely do enjoy the school system. I want to speak on behalf of the school system. We really have a great set of teachers. We have a great set of administrators, and we have a great set set of uh, PTA folks that keep they're they're keeping the wheels on the bus, so to speak. But they can only do so much. They really can. Um, I'm trying to trying to frame in my mind actually how this problem started and what we can do to fix it. And it was clear tonight, and I want to mention a few comments. One was from you, uh, Mr. Medford. You said, I hope that the, uh, uh, the additions or the uh, portable buildings are going to be on time. 
those are not words of comfort to parents when the board is saying they hope something's going to be done because hope is not a course of action. A good, solid, executable plan is a course of action. And Ms. Kirschke, you said that we need a plan now. Well, we needed a plan five years ago. So we really are in crisis mode. So what we need to do is what you can do within your authority and your scope. You can redistrict, you can balance the load across county. I know that's going to be painful for some of the other school systems. They're probably not looking forward to that. But the students at the school, great students from all social structure, right? The school is very accommodating and they get love and attention from everybody. But we, we can only do so much, so we need the board to act on their behalf. You guys need to put pressure on the county and we're going to do the same to put the same pressure on the county. So uh, a big challenge ahead. I'm just asking you guys to consider the students of that school system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Crystal Hickman. Good evening. I'm Crystal Hickman. I reside at 110 Poplar Point Road, Yorktown. And I'm also here this evening to speak uh, about the overcrowding at Yorktown Elementary specifically. I'm the parent of a third grader at Yorktown Elementary who is in a classroom of 26 students, and that does vary. It may be 25, 27, depending on the comings and goings. But therefore, the overcrowding issue is very personal to me and my family. Our education journey began in 2008, 2009 timeframe when we were living in Newport News. Our only child was three years old at the time, and we made the decision to move to York County in the name of the schools. Like most families, we did our research, and at that time, yes, had only 528 students. And in addition to being a math, science, and technology school, which is wonderful, it had a diverse population. We were sold. So, in only three years later, my son entered kindergarten in 2012. And in that very year, an additional kindergarten class had to be added to equal seven kindergarten classes. And unfortunately, this took place after the school year started. So here are the small kindergartners, you know, being plucked from their classroom, <coughs> entered into a new classroom with a new teacher after the school year began. So this is how we started our process at Yorktown Elementary. Sorry. Okay, so now we're all the way here to 2016 with over 700 students and a lot more projected to come our way. So at this point to me, the overcrowding issue at Yorktown, Elem <clears throat> at Yorktown <coughs> Elementary feels negligent. These are our children. This is the most important thing we do in this life. And although my son is in an overcrowded classroom this year, I must say he is blessed with an experienced STEM oriented fantastic teacher but the bottom line is he has 26 to 27 students and if there is any one-on-one -on -one assistant that needs to happen it's not going to he can't do it I'm an active member of the PTA I'm a regular volunteer in the classroom I see this firsthand and God forbid you have any discipline issues <clears throat> then it's really out the window the problem I'm sorry the other issue that I have is that these teachers still do not have paraeducators more than, <clears throat> excuse me, 30 minutes a day. This doesn't cut it. It also creates a hardship for the kindergarten classes that the pairs were taken from. These are small children, obviously, that need a lot more hands-on. So it's, it's like robbing, you know, Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. I have seen firsthand the the and witnessed as being a PTA volunteer and in the classroom firsthand how this is so frustrating for the students and the teachers alike. And just today, while I'm in my son's classroom volunteering, this child gets overstimulated because his personal space is being embarded. We're sitting tightly at a table and he couldn't take it. I mean, he started to cry. He's upset. We're out in the hallway trying to do reading one-on-one -on -one with children as people are literally stepping on us as they go by. You need to wrap that up, please. Okay. I just uh, really, really strongly want you to consider rezoning now, and we need to expedite a new school, not delay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> okay, once again, anybody that did not have a chance to speak, did not sign up, will have a, a chance to do so at the end of the uh, at the end of the meeting. At this time, we're going to open our public forum on the FY17 operating budget. There is nobody s signed up to speak. Um, is there anybody that would like to speak that has not signed up, has not done so, on the operating budget specifically? Come on up. Name and address, please, young lady. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Laurel Garaltz. I reside at 100 Leanne Court in Yorktown. I wasn't going to speak tonight, um, and usually I have a pretty good list of things I want to say because I know I have three minutes. Um, I'm York County PTA president, and I've been a PTA leader for 10 years, so I've seen a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, first of all, I do want to say thank you for holding the community forum. I know in the past 10 years what I've been trying to do is get more communication to make sure that parents feel informed and that they know what's going on in their community, and I feel like those public forums uh, are doing just that. So I want, to conti want those to continue. Uh, as far as YES, <laughs> I keep he hearing everyone talk about what are we going to do in September, and I would ask that you think about what you can do now, <laughs> because worrying about September isn't helping the kids at this point. Um, I know I've sent emails asking to have people look at noise-canceling panels to be put in the cafeteria. I know when Karen Washington was uh, principal, she was uh, had kids lead up a project um, doing the research on those. I think you could probably add those now. It would alleviate some of the issue. I think adding some cafeteria monitors now would really help. Um, you've got kids starting lunch at 10.30 and ending at about 1.15. Um, having some cafeteria monitors would help, especially when the kids are doing the walk and talk and some people are taking them out. Um, I also think that you could add a part-time nurse this year. Um, it's my understanding that we have one nurse with all of those kids and she's having a hard time seeing all the kids um, and dealing with the issues that, are, that come about with that. Um, I also urge you to do the research and look into getting a modular unit to add more lunch space. Do the research now, if that can help with next year, especially now that we're pushing back the cafeteria construction, um, I urge you to do that. Um, I encourage each of you to invite your Board of Supervisors counterpart to visit YES during lunch as well. Um, many of you have probably been in there, but I think it's important for the Board of Supervisors to see exactly what we're dealing with. I know some of them may be reluctant to approve um, the new school, we need to have you invite them into the school so they can see firsthand instead of just hearing what the parents are saying, hearing what the community is saying, and hearing what you're saying. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If there's nobody else signed up, I'll close the form on the FY17 budget, operating budget. This time we're going to turn to matters by school school board members, and I'm going to uh, start, Mr. Mentor, with you on the end down there. Thank you, Dr. Choice. First of all, I'd just like to really say thank you to all the citizens that came out to speak on the various issues. Uh, you know, for me, I take this very seriously because people talk about your child. I feel like I have 12,400 or 500 kids in school, and they're all very important to me, and I'm sure we're going to do everything we can. And uh, Thank you again for coming out. Uh, just to be quick as possible, we've had a lot of stuff back and forth. Mr. Mefford, I wanted to thank you for last year as chairman, the job you did, and the many challenges we had. And Dr. George, thank you for taking on the challenge and looking forward to it. And uh, I thought uh, we always have a lot of issues to go through, and you did a fantastic job on it. Um, just a couple of things I'd like to comment on is that the went to the science fair on the 14th of January. Always blows me away the things these kids do. I walk in and try to understand it and uh, so they just sit me in my place real quick. But my hat's off to all the people involved and the projects the kids have and all that the parents go through to make sure these projects, their contributions. Uh, also on the 16th of January, uh, we had our 50th year anniversary celebration for the New Horizons Regional Education Center. It was really a fantastic thing. They did it at Point Plaza. Uh, had a lot of the old administrators come back and uh, some students actually came in and, and some of the students have actually become instructors in part. So that was really good. 
also that uh, since I'm on CTA, I'd just like to say that the latest school board journal we got uh, talks about 20, uh, CET 21st Century Reboot Urban Advocacy, and it's a pretty good article in there. And there was a gentleman that uh, James Stone, he's a CTA researcher, and he wrote some information in the back of the book here. He talked about what are some of the benefits of high quality CTE. It provides a vehicle for young people who, uh, to understand why and what they're learning in their uh, academic and in their classes is so important. Uh, we've done research where we've interviewed teachers who have had students go through some of the uh, contextualized learning in an auto shop and maybe cosmetology and IT labs. They talk about how it really changed uh, students' ability to wake up and pay attention to class. Research shows that when math, science, and English are woven in with CTA courses and students apply their knowledge to the real world problems, they become more engaged and perform better. So I thought that was really good. Um, also like on the 18th, uh, had an opportunity to attend the Martin Luther King breakfast. Uh, students were great, uh, well attended. I think it was about 470 people there. It was a pretty full room. So I enjoyed that. And um, with that, I quit. <laughs> Mr. Mustard, it's, it's different down here. Um, but it's, it's a little, that's different. Uh, a couple of things I want to bring up. One, it was York River Academy. I don't know if you all caught the WI Daily um, press release. Um, they had an opportunity to um, have some fun with some drones. Um, everybody's starting to hear more and more about those. But they were able to get hold of or actually get a grant from Best Buy, and it's a traveling program. And York River Academy, um, our, our charter school, was fourth on the stop. And the students basically it gave them, it was a robotics workshop kind of thing that went along with the, the aerial part of it. But it was a creative approach to meeting the Virginia technology standards of learning for high school students while also promoting literacy and workforce development, which kind of goes along with the career technical education pieces and stuff. But one of the things that, um, that Dave Kofer, a special education teacher there at York River Academy, had to say, was uh, he described the program as a good fit for, for the students at the school, the student body, that includes students with particular interest in technology as well as students who thrive in the non-traditional learning environments. So we see the accent on academics and things. I love to see them launch a couple of drones in your call um, because I think it, they, were, they were navigating obstacle courses in the gymnasium there at York River Academy to promote and to develop their skills that they got from this program. So I thought it was pretty awesome. Um, I didn't catch that, so I wasn't invited for some odd reason. I would like to try to fly one of those things. Um, but hats off to the York River Academy students that participated in that. Um, Lowell Geralt talked about the public forum. We've had two public information sessions now, a reference to the growth in the county and the Magruder and the Yorktown Elementary School zones. Yorktown Elementary, I can speak to that one. That's the one I attended. And we had a really good turnout, about 70, I guess, 75 um, folks showed up um, wanting to, to know information, wanting just to, you know, figure out what's, what's, what's going on, uh, where, where, where are we going, and where have we been. And our staff did a tremendous job presenting information. There's a lot more to be done. And on that topic, I'm, I've been in York County my entire life. This is where I grew up, now product of the schools. And this is not the first time we've seen an area hit with growth. We've not, this is not the first time I've, I've been in trailers teaching um, there. So Mount Vernon got hit. Bethel Manor had 20-some trailers back there for years. Um, but it doesn't excuse the fact of what we're dealing with. It's, it's, it's the process I think is what we as a board are really going to have to take a real um, um, stern, strong um, observation to look at because we lived through the Dare Elementary School fiasco. We learned a lot. We don't go with the lowest bidder anymore. We go with the lowest, help me out, Mark, qualified bidder. And so that changed a lot of different things that we do as a board when we approve um, the people that do our construction and the architects and such. But 
one of the things that we have to rely on, and I think that some, some people mentioned this, and that is the people that control our dollars, the people that control our CIP and control the approval of every single item that's on the CIP. All we can do as a board is to approve the items on the CIP based on input from forecast out recommendations from our staff, the people that do the job every single day. They bring us the recommendations. We Finally, it becomes a board document. We send it up the street to the Board of Supervisors. They obviously have a lot of different things to balance with things going on in the county besides just our CIP. They got their projects too, and it comes down to debt service borrowing and everything that gets kind of technical. But the reality is we have a school that has reached or has, it's, it's gotten to the point where it needs to be taken care of, but unfortunately, because of things being delayed in the CIP, this is where we land. This is where we, land. Um, we need to do things better, obviously, as a board, to ask more questions maybe that we're not asking. Um, we've, we've been on the front of trying to get an elementary school in the CIP for years. Um, York County, to give them credit, though, they have been very good to us with keeping our infrastructure so if you look at our CIP projects over years and years, we have some really old buildings and they have approved projects so we can keep things um, going and not breaking. And, but as we think, see things now becoming delayed or whatever the reason might be going on, that needs to um, stop. And things need to now accelerate. Um, we all know that if you need something built and you got ready to put the dollars to it, you can make things happen. You can move things along. Um, we may end up having a look at, do we find somebody that can um, come in and give us advice or analyze or was it, what's the word, uh, basically look at and evaluate every one of our buildings and, and where we are and take an outside third party kind of look at what's going on. So there's different things we can do, but I know personally this is beyond ridiculous and something needs to be done um, while we end up in these situations. and. I'm going to rely on the superintendent down there to have conversations with the county administrator to kind of start bringing some closure to some of this stuff and to make sure their staff and our staff continues to work towards a solution um, as we move forward because uh, we're, this is, we're in it for the long haul. It's not going to go away. Um, Magruder is about ready to get slammed. Um, they're going to require a bunch of classrooms up there too. We just got two zones that just, um, it's happening. And um, we're, we're very happy that people want to come here for our schools. But I think that our counterparts on the Board of Supervisors need to realize that comes with a cost. It comes with an obligation and a responsibility to help us as a board move our recommendations so we can get things done in a timely manner. With that, thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone for speaking tonight. Um, I say this every month when we have a crowd. It's very nice to hear input from parents, citizens, and I appreciate you um, doing that. Well, York Elementary, um, I know you're bursting from the seams, and I'm worried about the capacity of the cafeteria to handle your enrollment for the fall. Um, I believe we probably do need to tweak the zoning areas to see what we can do. Um, Coventry has had decreased enrollment, but we still have large class sizes. So if, even if we tweak the enrollment, you still may have large class sizes. And I know Coventry's not the only one. We have 24 students in the kindergarten class at Coventry with limited paraeducator help. Um, third and fourth grade classes may have 29. And that has been the, the 29 students in third and fourth grade, that has become typical at Coventry Elementary School, and I'm very concerned about that. So um, enrollment may not mean small class sizes, because like I said, Coventry has had decreased enrollment and continues to have large class sizes. Um, school start times, uh, I think you all, everyone probably knows that I support a traditional start time. I want to thank Dr. Williams for coming here and sharing your expertise. I'm sure you see it every day. I know um, a couple of years ago when I brought up the issue of uh, a traditional school start time, it was because a parent had told me 
that her daughter thought she had uh, attention deficit disorder. She took her to a pediatrician and the pediatrician said, no, you do not have attention deficit disorder. You are sleep deprived. Um, I wanna thank you all. It's very important that you come to us and tell us your opinions about policy and about the way your public schools are run and managed. I believe the lady's already left, but I did want to make a note that parents actually talked to me this past month about advanced courses in middle school. They were upset because there are no advanced courses for science and history in middle school. So that may also be an area that we need to um, look at in the future. We do have advanced courses for English, math, and we have uh, uh, high school foreign language classes, but not science and history. Um, and now I want to acknowledge and congratulate some of our students and teachers. First, it's always a proud night to attend the IB ceremony in January and see our graduates return to receive their IB diplomas and to watch our IB juniors make the pledge to uh, and become formally inducted into the International Baccalaureate program. While the IB program is part of York High School, we have students from all across the county participate in the IB program, several from um, District 2 who attend York High School and make that transfer. Um, I would recommend any middle school students thinking about an alternative to their home school to think about the IB program at York High. Um, and I want to note that transportation is provided for students who are out of the zone. Another alternative in secondary education is our charter school that Mr. Medford talked about, York River Academy. I love this school. I absolutely love this school and the opportunities that it provides our students. Many students transfer from Grafton to YRA and they tell me that it made all the difference. It helped them find their way, it helped them graduate on time, and it also helped them graduate with the technical skills to find a job in the workforce. And I'm sorry, Mr. Medford, but I do want to um, say thank you to Walt Cross because I did attend the drone flying ceremony and program. And I also want to thank, it was a grant through Best Buy, but the Newport News Library included our YRA students. So we also need to thank them for doing that. The kids made flying a drone look very easy. I've flown a drone before and it's not as easy as they made it look. They learned so much and they had fun in the process. I also want to say a uh, job well done and give kudos to the teachers and students at Coventry Elementary School who held a transformative learning fair last month. Um, I really enjoyed seeing the students and what they had learned and what they had given back to the community. One project showcased uh, how students visited a convalescent home and they definitely brightened the seniors' day. There is a picture they have of a retired school teacher reading to the Coventry students. And that picture just says a thousand words, um, paints a thousand words. The kids made a tremendous difference in the lives of the retirees there. So um, I want to thank them for doing that. And uh, next week I'll be at Grafton Bethel, so I look forward to reading a book to the Grafton Bethel kids. Thank you. Ms. Awood. Thank you. <clears throat> so much has been said, and I'm gonna try not to be repetitive. Um, the science fair, again, was, was wonderful. Mr. Um, Mentor mentioned that. And I also want to uh, say to Mr. Mentor, thank you for you and Mrs. Mentor being part of the NAACP AXO breakfast. Um, we had some students here this evening that were recognized, but the one nice thing about the breakfast is shows the talent and the academic achievement of our students, uh, our African-American students. But it also is a fundraiser because these students go on to compete across the state and nationally in a variety of areas. And we have had some national winners to come back. So it was a fantastic um, morning. Um, and as he said, the room was full. So uh, if you wanted to see anybody in the greater Williamsburg area, that was the place to be. Um, with regards to the two elementary schools busting at the seams, it's gonna be a long process to continue to work 
with the Board of Supervisors to get the needs that we need for the school division. We will have a joint meeting tomorrow night. So, and it's, uh, it's here, 6 o'clock downstairs. It's a public meeting. Uh, feel free to, to be there to listen. Uh, please follow us on all the, the York County stations, on, in the, on the website, and so forth, that we will continue to need the full community's support in trying to get all that we need for our students. <clears throat> In the information that came out from the superintendent uh, this past week, uh, it indicated that, uh, and I also got an invitation, the School of the Arts Dance uh, class, along with MSAM, will be uh, presenting uh, at the Shape America Southern District Convention. And that's going to be held at the Williamsburg Lodge on February the 11th, and it's, it's free, open to the public. So we look forward to um, the School of the Arts, the dance group, and MSAM, which is the middle school dance group participating. Lastly, I want to send out kudos to Mrs. Susan, Mrs. Sandra Morosky at Magruder Elementary. She's a kindergarten teacher at Magruder. Um, she has a kindergarten student that was recently diagnosed with leukemia. And she promised to have her head shaved if at least $500 was raised, $500 was raised uh, to support her student who's undergoing treatment for leukemia. Well, the school went far beyond that challenge and raised more than, then it was $3,000. I don't know how much more over that. But uh, a kudos to her. The kids were excited. Uh, the staff was excited, and we've seen pictures. The news media picked it up. It was a fantastic opportunity, and we wish the student uh, speedy recovery and improved health. And with that, Dr. George. Is that all you got? That's all I got. They've said a lot for me. You know, I just closed my notepad. I'm just, they've, they've done such a good job. <clears throat> um, the only thing I could say is, once again, Mark, I want to thank you for your service uh, as yes. board chair. and. I've been out with the flu for a while and a little out of the, little out of the loop, and I didn't wasn't at the last meeting, and they called me and told me I was chair. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's what happens when you uh, when you don't show up. But anyway, it's an honor, and uh, I appreciate it very much. Okay, moving on. Financial matters, Ms. Kershke. Okay. I also want to make a note before I start this that if anyone at home wants more information about the financial report, the documents are posted online on our website, yorkcountyschools.org. Under the school board, under school board meetings, you'll find the agenda. The total for claims certified for payment for the month of December is $2,671,772.50. What a way to clear the room, start talking about yep. the financial report. If you look at significant expenditures for December, you will see the monthly expenses to um, Dominion Power, Sodexo, and we also have construction expenses, including $110,400 and $166,301 to Oyster Point Construction for the additions and renovations at Waller Mill as well as 12,273 for HVAC and partial roof replacement at Magruder. Also note we paid $13,917 to Centennial contractors to paint the exterior of nine portable classroom trailers. These are existing trailers scattered across seven different schools and the trailers are about 15 years old and looked rather shabby and needed a coat of paint. A few other items to be highlighted include two payments for literacy materials for kindergarten through third grade, and these ed educational materials complement the new literacy program. $70,452 to York County for the SROs. This is the first quarter's payment for five resource officers, one at each of our four high schools and one at the middle school level that floats between the middle schools and also serves as a substitute. We have two payments, 
$86,318 to New Horizons, and $12,040 to Grafton Integrated Health for special education services. And it's important to note that when YCSD cannot accommodate the needs of our special needs students, we must contract their educational services through specialized companies such as New Horizons and Grafton Integrated Health. And one item I want to point out is $44,316 for computers at Grafton High School. This replaced old laptops and added a few more to help with online SOL testing. As you know, our SOL testing is all done online now. So we can turn to the monthly financial report for December. We've received 67% of our revenue, or $87,151,805.54. Expenditures to date total $46,189,372.47. If you compare FY15 to FY16 actual finances, it's important to note that um, we did receive summer school tuition earlier this year. We usually receive it in February. We received it earlier, and this is for summer school payments for last summer of 2015. Also, uh, impact aid payments are less, as you know, due to the timing of when the federal government pays us. But good news, next month you should see an increase in federal impact aid funding. If we go to the monthly food service report, we have to date $1,141,838, and the uncollected balance is $3,820,145. Expenditures to date total $1,053,756. Now, if you compare revenue received at this point last year to today, you'll notice a decrease of more than $71,000. Sodexo says that breakfast sales are up, but lunch sales are down. However, they are not concerned at this point. Again, I think if you remember what I've said the last two months, last year we had an early Labor Day, so we had an additional week, whereas we had a late Labor Day this year. So um, part of that is because of that uh, additional week. But it's definitely uh, an issue that we need to watch. Okay. Let's turn to the consideration of resolution number 1605 to authorize specific procurements. $97,096 for athletic training services. This is the annual bill for our athletic trainers. The most expensive item is the tuition for New Horizons Special Education Services, which is $700,000. This pays for educational services for 20 York County students who have autism or they are emotionally disabled and we cannot provide services for these students so they must attend another school. They must attend New Horizons. But we also have a tuition bill of 60000 for special ed services at the Grafton Integrated Health Network for three students. $110,000 for band uniforms at Grafton. It's their turn this year. The replacement of band uniforms is on a 10-year rotation basis. It's important to note that this only covers 50% of the actual cost to replace band uniforms. The schools and booster groups must pay the remaining half. We have $119,739 for warranty renewal, network switches, and an IT expense. $89,660 for the installation of electrical waste and water utilities for the modular classrooms at Yorktown Elementary and Magruder. We've got one Yorktown parent out there. So this is prep work. This is good news. This is prep work for the modular classrooms coming in the summer for September. So they are getting started um, with that work, so it's all done, and it'll be a little bit easier when they do have the modulars in place. The new modulars will have restrooms, so um, that's another good thing about these trailers. 
$153,957 for projectors, cameras, wireless access points for the new classroom additions at Waller Mill. If you look down, um, you'll see an $83,734 expense for classroom supplies, furniture for, for the new additional classrooms at Waller Mill. Jump back up to $75,000 for gym floor removal and replacement at Magruder. And $92,344 for 108 laptop computers for career and tech labs at all high schools so that our students can take their certification test. And that will be paid for through a Carl, the Carl Perkins grant. And with that, I move the financial report. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions? <clears throat> Ms. Ford? Haywood to approve financial matters. Mrs. Kirschke? Yes. Mr. Medford? Yes. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. Mr. Minter? Yes. And Dr. George? Yes. This time we've come to our consent calendar. We have four items, uh, approval of personnel actions, approval of donations, consideration of a motion to approve an overnight trip for 10 Bruton High School cross country team members, and approval of the minutes from a regular meeting on November 23rd, 2015, December 7, 2015, December 14th, 2015. All board members were present. Does anybody wish to pull any of these items this evening? No. Okay, I'm going to make a motion to uh, approve the consent calendar. Second. A motion is made by Dr. George and seconded by Mrs. Kursky to approve the consent calendar. Mr. Medford? Yes. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. Mr. Minter? Yes. Mrs. Kursky? Yes. And Dr. George? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Ford. At this time, we have action items. We have four action items on our list. <coughs> Excuse me. The first is a consideration of approval of a proclamation for career and technical education month. Dr. Sander? Thank you, Dr. George. Board members, um, just to read an ex excerpt from the proclamation, your county recognizes the importance of the skills and knowledge in career and technical education courses provide our students. Career and techni technical education programs are ever-changing to incorporate core academics with real-world applications to meet our county's to meet our country's current and future education and skill needs, excuse me. We appreciate the work of our career and technical education teachers as well as those at New Horizon. Okay, can I get a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. Ms. Ford. A motion is made by Mr. Mentor and seconded by Mr. Medford to approve the proclamation for Career and Technical Month. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. Mr. Medford? Yes. Mr. Mentor? Yes. Mrs. Kursky? Yes. And Dr. George? Yes. Next, we have a consideration of approval of a proclamation for National School Counseling Week. Dr. Shander. Thank you, Dr. George. Again, I want to read just a, an excerpt from the proclamation. This week, um, February 1st through the 5th, has been designated as National School Counseling Week. We have a proclamation to recognize our commitment to helping students explore their abilities, strengths, interests, and talents as these tra traits relate to career awareness and development. The 34 licensed counseling staff members in YCSD not only um, all 12, not only support all 12,000 plus students across the school division and their parents, but their fellow teachers daily, and we're thankful for their hard work. Can I have a motion to approve? <clears throat> Move approval. Second. Second. Ms. Ford. A motion is made by Mrs. Haywood and seconded by Mrs. Kurschke to approve National School Counseling Week. Mr. Minter. Yes. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. Mr. Medford? Yes. Mrs. Kurschke? Yes. And Dr. George? Yes. Next, we have a consideration of approval of a proclamation for Read Across America Day. Dr. Shannon? Thank you, Dr. George. Again, we want to thank, uh, I want to thank Ms. Bauer and the group of students and staff that we had here this evening um, as we sported our wonderful hats for <laughs> Read Across America Day. Um, they, we, the team shared earlier this evening that March 2nd is Read Across America Day in celebration of Dr. Seuss's birthday, which promotes reading and adult involvement in education through the school division. We encourage staff members to go, go, into our, go out to our schools, read to our students as a way to celebrate reading and to engage with our students. I'm looking forward to it. I had actually Ms. Ford sign me up multiple times, so I'm looking forward to getting into our schools. And the last item is consideration of approval of minutes from the annual special, oops, I'm sorry, yeah. sorry, uh, I'll motion. Move, I'll, I'll move that motion. I'm getting ahead of America. myself here. Second? Second. Ms. Ford? 
A motion is made by Mr. Medford and seconded by Mrs. Kursky to approve the proclamation for Read Across America Week. Mrs. Kursky? Yes. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. Mr. Mentor? Yes. Mr. Medford? Oh. Yes. And Dr. George? Yes. Okay. You okay? The last item is a consideration of approval of minutes from the annual special meeting on January 11, 2016. I was absent, out sick. Everybody else was present. Uh, I need a motion to approve. So moved. And a second. Second. Ms. Ford. Okay, a motion was made by Mrs. Korski and seconded by Mr. Mentor to approve the minutes from January the 11th. Mr. Medford? Yes. Mrs. Haywood? Yes. Mr. Mentor? Yes. Mrs. Korski? Yes. And Dr. George? Abstain. And under policy, we have one item under discussion. Dr. Shander, would you like to provide some information? Yes, I'm going to ask Dr. Guy if she'll please step to the podium to provide some information regarding Section L, Education Agency Relations of the York County School Board Policy Manual. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. Chairman George, members of the board, as part of the quadrennial review of the policy manual, revisions to Section L, Education Agency Relations, is provided for discussion. This section includes, but is not limited to, relations with private schools, home instruction, charter schools, and agreements with colleges and universities to provide opportunities for student teaching, as well as post-secondary opportunities for students at the community college level. Most of the proposed revisions are grammatical in nature and were the result of changes within the Virginia School Boards Association Policy Manual. There are no substantial changes to language or practice. Additionally, cross-references to other sections and policy have been added and references to former heading titles have been removed. Are there any questions that I could answer? I have no questions. This is Thank pretty you. much straightforward, just like we've been doing everything yes. else. Thank you, Dr. Guy. You're welcome. <clears throat> we have nothing under first reading, nothing under second reading. So that brings us to the report of our superintendent. Thank you, Dr. George, board members. For the first thing I want to um, share with the community this evening and, and board members is um, <coughs> that I'm thankful for the feedback from the community. We had um, a number of different topics presented this evening, and I certainly appreciate uh, that feedback, and I'm really looking forward to working through the issues that we face. We, we face a number of challenges, but as we continue to work with our community and work with our stakeholders, I believe we can work through uh, any of those challenges that, that we face. Um, with that said, um, I think Mr. Medford mentioned it earlier, um, our team held information sessions at Yorktown Elementary in Magruder with the community, and again, so thankful that we had community members come to both of those sessions. They've asked, they've asked a lot, us a lot of questions as we move forward um, regarding a number of the issues we face. So I want to thank both of those principals publicly um, for organizing those events. Um, second, um, we had some board members mention the, um, the NAACP AXO breakfast. I attended that as well with uh, Mr. Minter and Ms. Haywood. But I want to bring it up for another reason. We have two staff members who really do a lot of work um, in helping uh, organize that event, and that's Reggie Fox, who works in our instructional department. He did a great job emceeing the event and leading, and also Dr. Catherine Jones, who's done a lot of facilitation with, uh, with a number of the schools in the Williamsburg and York County School Division. So really proud of, of our team um, for leading the event, also really proud of the kids. And, and our, we had administrators from all of the schools um, announcing their uh, accomplishments, so we certainly celebrate them. And the last item I wanted to um, cover is uh, weather conditions. So as, as many of the folks in the county know, we had a, a weather, um, weather issue the last weekend. What a, what a difference a week makes, 70-some uh, <laughs> degrees today. Um, I want to thank first our students and parents for their patience and understanding in light of our recent weather-related closings and cancellations. I appreciate also the hard work of our operations staff, uh, um, specifically um, Mr. Lash, uh, Mr. Dolak, uh, and all of our members of our operations team that, that Dr. James is over. Uh, they, they spent a great deal of time coordinating how we're going to you know, look at our sidewalks and, and uh, where our parent drives are and all of those types of things with ice removal, snow removal. It takes a lot of coordination, so I certainly appreciate all of their efforts. Also really appreciate our county staff. Um, you know, made, uh, made contact with Neil Morgan during that, uh, during that time. He's also a, a resident uh, weather guy who really understands the weather in this area and provides me some, some good information. But he really helped us coordinate 
with the resources they have to really help us and assist us with our parking lots, as well as communicate with VDOT. As you know, uh, the northern part of Virginia uh, was hit uh, dramatically more than, than we were, dramatically more than we were, and so a lot of those resources were sent north. But once we communicated where we needed some specific assistance, folks at the county assist, greatly assisted uh, with communicating that information to VDOT so they were able to support us. So really want to um, send out my appreciations for them. Also wanted the community and staff to know where we stand as of today in terms of our bank time. As you recall, we implemented a two-hour delay earlier this fall. Um, and we and called three snow days in January. After adjusting our schedule last week, we now have the equivalent of, of just over three days banked in our schedule. Um, so I can tell you, um, I know I'll be hoping that the groundhog does not see his shadow tomorrow morning. So um, as we move forward, our commitment is to safety of all students and staff in our school division. And um, we'll appreciate, again, everyone's patience as we move forward. So that concludes the superintendent report. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. Thank you. Is there anybody that wishes to address the board that did not have a chance to do so? If not, our meeting is adjourned. Have a good evening. <laughs>